Welcome to the second of the HDI Spring Seminars um, seminar series. Today we'll be hearing from our panel of four um, who will speak from a variety of perspectives on the DSM-5 changes and implications. We'll begin with Ted Gudlowski. He's a professor with UK Psychiatry and College of Social Work. And then we'll hear from Dr. Tom Prout, professor with UK School Psychology Program. I uh, believe followed by Myra Beth Bundy. She's a professor of psychology at EKU and, and the Autism Certificate Program Coordinator. And then we'll hear from Christy Lieber, and she's a family therapist in private practice in LCSW here in Lexington, correct? Um, we're very pleased to be co-hosting this event along with UK's Rehab Counseling Program and in conjunction with UK's College of Social Work, the, ed the Educational Counseling and School Psych Program, and also the Psychology Program at EKU. And just to go over a few details for today, um, we're coming to you live from HDI's Coldstream location here in Lexington. And obviously we have a variety of sites around the state that we're also being broadcast to you live. Um, because we do this, we ask you to keep your microphones muted um, at all the uh, other sites, unless you're asking a question. And then we'll take the time at the end of each presenter's section to answer questions that you might have for them. And hopefully we'll also have a few minutes at the very end to cover some more general questions that you might come up with by then. We'll also be taking a 10 minute break at 2.40 um, for everyone to get up and stretch a little bit. So thank you. Hi, I'm Ted Gudlaski and I'm gonna be talking longest today. Uh, mainly about uh, some of the general changes uh, in the DSM-5. And also, uh, I want to touch on issues related to uh, diagnosis for substance use disorders, since that is a significant change and no one else is going to talk about it, so I'll do it. Okay. First of all, because I, I teach psychopathology, uh, I always like to make a few general comments about diagnostics uh, before talking about something like the DSM-5. And whenever we are talking about diagnosis, uh, we're basically struggling with problems of epistemology. Okay? How do we know what we know, and how do we know that what we know is true, basically, or real? I like to phrase this in terms of the problem of the three umpires, like baseball umpires. And the first umpire says, there are, there are balls and there are strikes, and I call them the way they are. And that's kind of the position of radical realism. And if we apply that to diagnostic, it mean, diagnostics, it means that we actually believe that there are these specific mental disorders, that they are real entities in the real world, that they have real existence. Okay? The second umpire says, there are no balls and there are no strikes until I call them. And that's the position of kind of logical positivism. And again, applied to diagnostics, that would mean that uh, these diagnostic categories that we use are simply mental constructs or social constructs, that they have no reality and no particular value in and of themselves. And the last is the third umpire that says, there are pitches that are balls and there are pitches that are strikes, and I call them as I see, as best I can. And that's the position of rational realism, and, I, and that's the position I advocate uh, for my students, that um, Diagnoses are somewhat arbitrary. Uh, they're groupings together of symptoms. And uh, that uh, they have a kind of secondary reality because what we're really talking about is behavior, thoughts, affects, cognition, perception. And th those are what is real. And the uh, the diagnoses are kind of like uh, a, a kind of abstraction, one level beyond those, uh, lumping them together into specific syndromes. And uh, that uh, although the lumping is somewhat arbitrary to a degree, it has real value. It has value in terms of indicating what are appropriate therapeutics in specific cases, it may have implications in terms of issues related to family history and genetics, and it certainly has implications in terms of research. So I think that whenever we talk about diagnosis, it's best to adopt the framework of rational realism, okay, as opposed to the other two. Now we also have, well, uh, well, what we really diagnose are varieties of human suffering, basically. 
and uh, we lump together specific <coughs> signs and symptoms into syndromes. Unfortunately, unlike with uh, physical medicine, we don't have any clear diagnostic markers for these things. There are no physical markers. There is no blood test you can take to determine whether someone has schizophrenia. You can't palpate someone's depression. Okay? Uh, and as a result, we have no real way of knowing that these syndromes are actually one thing, are actually a single entity, a single disorder. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, very little knowledge about where they come from. We have very little knowledge of etiology, and uh, we only vaguely understand how best to treat them. Um, uh, the fact is uh, that uh, many, if not most, in, uh, the fact is that many, if not most individuals, have more than one diagnosis, and we have to uh, face the fact that perhaps uh, the whole notion of comorbidity of individuals having multiple diagnoses, and that being the fact probably more often than not, uh, is uh, as much the result of our diagnostic categories not being able to adequately embrace human suffering as it is uh, the fact that individuals may actually have more than one disorder. Okay. So anyway, basically a, a problem of epistemology in terms of what exactly are these things that we call mental disorders? And we're fuzzy on that, we're vague on that, because we don't have the same kinds of guideposts that uh, standard medical treatment has. Okay? There also is a problem between categorical and dimensional diagnosis. Uh, what we're used to in, in the DSMs, okay, from one through four, is essentially a form of categorical diagnosis that uh, each uh, disorder forms a category in and of itself that is more or less distinct from other categories. Categorical diagnosis serves good purpose where the members of a specific group look very much like each other and very different from other people. So for example, if you look at the top bar in, that, uh, in, the, in the graphic there on your screen, okay, if I asked one of you to come up and point to the exact point where white becomes black, you wouldn't have any difficulty doing that because all the pixels on one side are far more similar to each other and quite different than the pixels on the other side. And there's a very clear delineation mark. Okay? The fact of the matter is, though, in much of diagnosis, our problems are not really categorical, they're dimensional. So, uh, for example, if I were to ask you to go to that second bar, the, the, the one with the colors on it, and point to red or green or yellow, you could probably do it without too much trouble. But if I asked you to point to the exact point at which red becomes uh, orange, or orange becomes yellow, or yellow becomes green, okay, it, it's much more <coughs> difficult to do because one tends to bleed into the other and it's hard to tell where one ends and the other begins. And that's often the way it is with diagnosis. And as a matter of fact, in the DSM-4, interestingly enough, it was left out in the DSM-5, in the introduction, it talks about the fact that there is no certitude that one disorder is actually completely distinct from any other disorder, or for that matter, that disorders are in and of themselves distinct from some variant of normal. And so we have this difficulty. And it would be nice if we could use uh, a, a more consistent and coherent uh, dimensional approach. And the DSM-5 has tried to move in that direction. So we have in the DSM-5 for the first time a kind of touch of dimensionality. Okay? So for example, it allows certain specifiers to be used with certain diagnoses, okay? so you don't have to use a, a second diagnosis. So for example, major depressive disorder with panic or persistent depressive disorder with anxious <laughs> distress, okay? recognizing the fact that there are uh, uh, many individuals who experience significant mood disorder, but also with very, very distinct and sometimes pretty graphic symptoms of, um, of anxiety. Okay? 
Uh, the DSM-5 also requires the clinician's rate severity of symptoms. In some cases, these symptom severities are rated by using some form of questionnaire or instrument. In other cases, uh, it uses a kind of table that gives kind of paradigmatic descriptions of different levels of severity. And severity, I think much to the credit of the DSM-5, is based more on functionality than anything else. However, there are also diagnoses in which you simply count symptoms. So for example, with substance use disorder, okay, if you have two to three symptoms, you're moderate. If you have four to five symptoms, or if you have two to three, you're mild. If you have four to five, you're moderate. And if you have six or more, you're severe without any reference to how functional you are. And so we have this kind of, you know, ambivalence about dimensionality, an attempt to move in that direction, but not fully or not totally. And I just wanted to show you uh, just a couple of the, of the instruments that are in the DSM-5. By the way, in the previous uh, uh, slide, right at the bottom, uh, that website, the American Psychiatric Association website, is a place that you can go and actually take a look at and download and print off uh, all the uh, instruments uh, for severity uh, in the DSM-5. Uh, this is uh, the DSM-5, what's called the, the cross-cutting measure, the main cross-cutting measure, step one cross-cutting measure. And it asks a series of questions uh, that relate to broad areas of problems in human beings. You'll notice on the extreme left there are Roman numerals. Each of those relates to a specific kind of area of diagnosis. And then you have questions that are then answered not yes or no, but in terms of uh, frequency of occurrence for these various things. Uh, this is uh, what those Roman numerals stand for. So one is for depression, and two is for anger, and three is for mania, and, and so forth. So that uh, when you, uh, if you find that someone seems to display these kinds of symptoms, you can then move to what are called, at least in most instances, you can move to what are called step two measures, which then can give you a more precise read on whether or not the individual does have a problem in that area, and if so, uh, how severe it might be. Uh, this is the uh, second uh, step uh, level uh, uh, instrument for depression. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, eight questions that are uh, rated from one to five, going from never to always. And so you can end up with a score of anywhere from eight to 40 on this instrument. You can then go to this little scale here that helps you convert your raw score to a T-score. And if you have a T-score of less than 55, then chances are you're not depressed. If you have a score of from 55 to 59.9, you're mildly depressed. 60 to 69.9, you're moderately depressed. And 70 or over, you're severely depressed. This is the same thing, so I know many of you work with children, and adolescents, this is the same measure of depression, uh, but for 11 to 17-year-olds. Okay. So they, they have uh, taken into account more than any of the other uh, previous versions of the DSM, the fact that uh, uh, children uh, often display symptoms of disorder that are significantly different than those of adults. So uh, they've tried to at least accommodate that to some degree. Okay. Now, in terms of sweeping changes in the DSM, first of all, uh, you remember the multi-axial diagnostic system? Well, forget it. It doesn't exist anymore, okay? There's no axis one, two, three, four, five, okay? Uh, axis, what used to be axis one, two, and three have been collapsed into, uh, into diagnosis, and diagnoses uh, whether they are of acute disorders or chronic lifelong disorders or uh, me medical disorders for that matter, uh, are simply listed uh, in order of emergence. So which, you know, which particular disorder seems to be causing the individual greatest dysfunction or which poses greatest risk to the individual? That you put first and then you, you know, make your best guess about the rest of them after that. Okay? Um, 
Axis uh, 4, which used to uh, uh, be a place where you could put psychosocial problems, uh, instead of that, what the DSM is advocating is that we now use uh, the V codes from the ICD-9, the International Categorization of Diseases, 9th edition, or the uh, Z codes from the ICD-10. And as a matter of fact, in the DSM-5, uh, uh, those uh, 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 V codes and Z codes are, are listed in the third section. Okay, for handy use, and, and actually they are fairly comprehensive, okay, for the most part. Axis 5 is uh, dropped, but there is a recommendation that we now use uh, the WHODAS, the World Health Organization uh, Disability Assessment Schedule, which is basically a, a measure, uh, it's a structured questionnaire that attempts to measure uh, the degree of a disability or dysfunction that the individual may be experiencing as a result of whatever their symptoms are. Okay? Uh, the uh, disorders have been kind of recategorized, and I'll show you those in a, in a minute. Uh, the plan essentially uh, tries to follow a kind of lifespan, uh, first of all, uh, with uh, beginning with the neurocognitive disorders that tend to be more prevalent or, or first show up in childhood, uh, all the way up to uh, the, uh, 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 the serious uh, dementias and whatnot that tend to show up in later life and everything in between. Also, uh, the diagnoses have been ordered uh, in terms of first looking at those that have internalizing system, uh, internalizing symptoms like depression, okay, uh, and then those that have externalizing symptoms like impulsive behavior. Okay. Uh, also, uh, you may remember the NOS not otherwise specified, which was part of every diagnosis that no longer exists. We now have uh, other specified and other unspecified diagnosis uh, under each specific category. And the preference is that you would use other specified. And when you use that, what you're specifying is the symptoms that you're observing. Okay? So for example, you might have someone uh, with um, uh, symptoms related to trauma, but whose symptoms do not meet criteria for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you can diagnose them as other, tra other traumatic disorders specified, and then you list the symptoms that you observe. So that's kind of, I, I kind of like that because some, some of the work I do is with trauma. And, uh, you know, it, it allows us basically to dignify people who are suffering as a result of trauma with a diagnosis, which we didn't have before. If they didn't meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a very high bar, okay, uh, there was no diagnosis that you could use. So now we have a kind of other specified kind of diagnosis. Uh, this is the WHODAS. I'm just, I'm not going to go through it at any great length. I just want to point out to you that it's arranged in terms of dom domains. So the first domain uh, looks at cognition. You know, how's the individual thinking? Uh, how's their memory? Uh, uh, mobility, how well can they get around? How much are they inhibited in getting around as a result of their uh, symptoms or disorder? Uh, Self-care, how well can they take care of themselves? Uh, getting along with other people, so kind of social interaction with other people. Okay? Uh, and then life activities, which breaks into two separate domains, those activities that are done around the house and those activities that are done in school or at work. Okay? And finally, uh, participation. So uh, how do symptoms affect the individual's ability not only to relate to other people, but to relate to their own family, to participate in their own community, uh, to basically be a social being, fundamentally, a participa uh, participating uh, social being in their own community. Okay? Now, uh, I, I'll run through these disorders very, very rapidly. Uh, I'm not going to mention many of them except to indicate where there might be some new diagnoses. We have, first of all, the neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, uh, intellectual disabilities have to do uh, with people that have uh, problems with intellectual functioning, basically, uh, mainly uh, beginning in childhood. And uh, one of the nice things, I think, 
uh, about this diagnosis is that the emphasis is not on IQ, it's on functionality. So individuals may have an IQ um, 70 or below, but they are functioning very well, and therefore you don't necessarily use this diagnosis with them. Uh, other individuals may have diagnosed, may have uh, IQs uh, above 70, but are doing very badly, and you might want to use this diagnosis with them. So the emphasis is away from IQ testing and onto functionality. Uh, then communication disorder, autism spectrum disorder, which you'll we'll hear more about in a bit. Uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The bar has been lowered for that a little bit, and uh, it has been lowered even more when we're talking about adolescents and adults. So we should plan on seeing uh, more individuals with a diagnosis of attentional deficit disorder. Okay. Um, and then specific learning disorder orders and motor disorders. Okay. Uh, schizophrenia spectrum and other disorders. That pretty much remains uh, much the same as it is. There have been some changes uh, in the diagnosis for schizophrenia. So uh, the uh, uh, notion that if the uh, delusions were bizarre enough, that's all that you needed is no longer there. Uh, or if you hear more than one voice uh, talking to each other, uh, that, that special, uh, that those are Schneiderian you know, first level hallucinations, that you no longer uh, give that any special consideration. Okay? Um, catatonia is now its own disorder, which is new, and catatonia can also be used as a qualifier for any psychotic disorder. Okay? Uh, then bipolar disorders remain pretty much the same. Uh, depressive disorders, uh, we have here a new <coughs> diagnosis which I think is an attempt to try to move practitioners away from giving uh, children and adolescents diagnoses of uh, bipolar disorder, bipolar one disorder. It's disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the rest remain pretty much as is. <clears throat> Persistent depressive disorder is what we used to call dysthymia, and also major depressive disorder that lasts longer than two years. Uh, the obsessive compulsive disorders uh, are pretty much unchanged. However, there is the addition uh, now of hoarding disorder. So uh, you can, uh, uh, and I'm not going to go through the criteria for that, but you know, for, it used to be simply a, a possible uh, 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 secondary symptom of certain disorders. Now it's its own disorder, and there is a. Uh, there is a nice little, it's, it's not in the, uh, the diagnosis itself, but in the text for the diagnosis, it also indicates that this often occurs not only with objects, but with animals. And we see that regularly, don't we, in Kentucky, that we, you know, have somebody that has, you know, 24 horses they can't feed or take care of, or 200 dogs, or 50 cats, or something like that. Okay. Probably what we're seeing here are manifestations of a kind of hoarding disorder. Okay. Uh, trauma and stress-related disorders. Uh, reactive attachment disorder has been broken into two diagnoses. First, reactive attachment disorder, which is the same as it was, uh, and uh, disinhibited, disinhibited social engagement disorder. So reactive attachment disorder for, for individuals who can't form attachments or have great difficulty forming attachments to anybody, uh, disinhibited social engagement disorder for individuals who too readily form attachments to people, who too easily form attachments to people. Okay. A post-traumatic stress disorder, we now have criteria uh, both for uh, individuals uh, over the age of six and under the age of six. So uh, again, a recognition that children experience trauma somewhat differently than adults do. Uh, dissociative disorders are still there. I'm not quite sure why. I don't think I've ever seen a case, but uh, anyway, uh, they're still there and they're pretty much unchanged. Uh, somatic symptom and related disorder. Uh, somatic symptom disorder is a new diagnosis. Uh, be careful of this. It only requires one symptom. And it is, at least in my mind, almost impossible to distinguish from someone that has a serious symptom or a serious illness and is quite preoccupied about it. So it's very hard to distinguish between somatic symptom disorder and a variant of normal. I mean, if I had a heart attack, I'd be pretty concerned about what my heart was doing for a while. Okay? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean I have a mental disorder. But, you know, I probably would meet criteria for this disorder. 
Uh, feeding disorders, uh, pretty much uh, as they have been. Um, elimination disorders, as they have been. Sleep-wake disorders, uh, pretty much the same. Uh, interestingly enough, breathing-related sleep disorders, which are actually not psychiatric disorders. They're actually not mental disorders. They're purely physical disorders, although they may have some uh, emotional sequelae uh, are listed here. Uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, pretty much the same uh, as uh, they have been. Uh, gender dysphoria is a new category of disorder here. So we have uh, gender dysphoria in children and gender dysphoria in adolescents and adults. Okay. Uh, disruptive impulsive control disorders, uh, pretty much the same as they have been. Uh, and substance-related disorders, which I just wanted to dwell on for just a little bit because <clears throat> that's my specialty area. Uh, first of all, uh, for substance use disorders, uh, there is no distinction anymore between dependence and abuse. It's only one disorder, substance use disorder. Okay? Uh, and uh, what happened uh, is they took the four criteria for, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the seven criteria for uh, dependence, if you remember from the DSM-4, uh, and merge them with three of the four criteria for abuse. They eliminated the criteria that has to do with legal problems, which I frankly don't mind because whether or not someone has legal problems because of their use of, a use of a substance may have more to do with how diligently the police enforce the law in a particular community than with how severe their problem actually is. And then they added a criteria for uh, compulsive use uh, to bring it more in line with the ICD-10, I think. Okay? We have some new diagnoses. We now have a behavioral addiction diagnosis for gambling disorder. And there are some people who have real uh, problems with that because uh, uh, once you start talking about behavioral addictions, where do you end? I mean, virtually anything human beings like to do and do often and may occasionally cause them a little trouble, I guess we could use the label of addiction for it. Okay? Uh, cannabis withdrawal is a new diagnosis. Okay. Uh, caffeine withdrawal is also a new diagnosis, even though there is no diagnosis for caffeine uh, use disorder. Okay. Uh, in the DSM-4, let me go back. The DSM-3 had separate criteria for um, uh, substance use problems uh, by drug. So there was a separate criteria for uh, alcohol dependence and alcohol abuse, for cocaine dependence and cocaine abuse, for uh, opiate dependence, opiate abuse. In the DSM-4, we got rid of that because we thought there was one uh, single underlying uh, addictive process, and so we had unitary criteria for substance use disorder, for substance <coughs> dependence and substance abuse, even though the diagnosis remained drug-specific. In the DSM-5, we've gone back to having separate criteria by each drug category for diagnosis. And I don't have the faintest idea why that's done or why that's been done, okay? But it's been done. Uh, uh, I already mentioned the specifiers. And uh, what used to be a qualifier for partial remission is no longer there. So now remission is like pregnancy. Either you are or you aren't. Okay? Either you're in remission or you're not. You can't be in partial remission anymore. Okay. Uh, can, I, I just wanted to, these are the criteria for cannabis withdrawal. Uh, they indicate three or more of the following symptoms, irritability, anger or aggression, nervousness or anxiety, sleep difficulty, decreased appetite or weight loss, restlessness, depressed mood, and at least uh, one of the following, or it could be, or one of the following symptoms that causes significant discomfort like abdominal pain, shakiness, tremors, sweating, fever, chills, or headache. Okay? Uh, I treated probably a couple thousand people with substance use disorder and have never seen marijuana withdrawal. But uh, I'm told that there are some animal experiments that indicate that it does exist. So it's not a terribly well-researched thing, but it's, it's there. When I look at these criteria, I probably could, in, I probably could provoke these criteria in most of you by taking away your cell phone. <laughs> uh, what I've done is I've taken the criteria and reduced them down again to a single set of criteria with blanks for the drug. 
So criteria, uh, the, the overall kind of mantra that begins it is that substance use disorder is a problematic pattern of the use of some kind of substance leading to a clinically significant impairment or distress as manifested by at least two. So now you only <coughs> need two out of 11 instead of three out of seven uh, for the diagnosis occurring within a 12-month period of time. Uh, the drug is often take or, taken in larger amounts or over a longer period than was intended, which indicates a loss of volitional control. Uh, there is a persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down or control whatever the substance is used. And again, the underlying concept here is one of a loss of volitional control. Uh, a great deal of time is spent in activities necessary to obtain whatever the substance is, use it, or recover from its effects. And the notion here is that over time, the substance use gains great centrality, importance in, in the life of the individual. Okay? And time being a measure of importance, we use time. We only have so much time, we spend more time on one thing, we have less time for other things. And how we spend our time is largely a measure of what's important to us. Uh, craving or strong desire or urge to use, this is a new criteria, okay? uh, and it has to do with uh, uh, basically a physiologic response to, to anything that indicates the presence of the substance. We have some good knowledge about the exact biology that underlies craving. It has to do with changes that occur in the neurons in the nucleus accumbens, uh, changes that are a result of a protein called delta FOS B. Uh, and so, you know, I'm okay with craving being added. Uh, recurrent uh, substance use despite uh, resulting in failure to fulfill major role obligations at work, home, or school. This was formerly an abuse criteria. Now the dependency criteria can be hard to apply to certain groups of people. You know, I mean, you know, failure is easy to measure if you've had previous success. So you have someone who's been successful meeting their major role obligations, now they're using a substance and they're failing to meet major role obligations, you can pretty safely say it's probably because of the substance use. What do you do for somebody who's never met major role obligations and now they're using, okay? Is it that they, is their substance interfering with their ability to do that or are they just bad at life, okay? So it's hard to apply to some uh, groups of individuals. Uh, continued substance use despite having persistent or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or worsened by the effect of the substance. Uh, this again is uh, a former abuse criteria. Uh, important social, occupational, or recreational activities given up or reduced because of substance use. And again, this is because of this, the importance, the centrality that the substance use uh, gains in the life of the individual. Okay. Uh, eight, recurrent use of, in situations that, is physical, that are physically hazardous, so being under the influence when you're doing something where you might harm yourself or someone else. Uh, substance use that is continued despite knowledge of having persistent or recurrent physical or uh, psychological problems that have been, have likely uh, have been caused or uh, worsened by. Uh, the use of the substance. This is one of the most abused of all the criteria. It's not about simply having a, a physical or psychological problem caused or worsened by the substance. It's knowing that you do and continuing to use. And again, it's an extension of that notion of the centrality of the substance abuse. So the individual is willing to risk their health, their sanity, and even their life in order to continue to use. Uh, Ten, uh, tolerance. Uh, which is exactly as it was in the previous criteria, and 11 withdrawal, okay, uh, exactly as it was in the previous criteria. I'm running uh, short on time here, so I'm gonna, uh, when you print this out, you can take a look at this uh, a case of a 34-year-old heavy marijuana user, okay, and uh, what I've done is I've highlighted the symptoms and uh, even though this guy looks like a train wreck, I mean, he's not working, he dropped out of school, lost his girlfriend, has no friends, has no job prospects, uh, given our current diagnostic scheme, uh, he would be a marijuana use disorder moderate, okay, because he meets five rather than six criteria. Okay. Uh, we know, now have a new disorder, gambling disorder, which is, again, a behavioral uh, uh, addiction disorder. Uh, it is modeled to some degree uh, after uh, the substance use kind of disorder 
So the need to grant gamble with increasing amounts of money in order to, to, to achieve desired level of uh, excitement. Uh, restless or Ill, irritable when attempts to cut down or stop gambling has made repeated unsuccessful efforts to stop gambling, is often preoccupied with gambling, often gambles when feeling distressed after losing money, uh, often returns the next day to get even, lies to conceal the extent of gambling, uh, has jeopardized or lost significant relationships, a job or education or career opportunities because of gambling, and relies <coughs> on others to provide money to relieve uh, desperate financial situations caused by gambling. So very much kind of parallel to uh, our other uh, uh, substance use uh, diagnoses. Okay. Uh, uh, then we, we have the neurocognitive disorders, which I'm not going to run through. And again, these neurocognitive disorders are all uh, basically uh, 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 medical kinds of issues, different <coughs> forms of dementia, <coughs> fundamentally. Personality disorders. Uh, they've gone back to uh, the, well, first of all, it's kind of interesting. Uh, first of all, they're, they're using the old cluster A, B, and C kind of nomenclature, which, you know, was kind of passing out of existence. They kind of revitalized it. I'm not quite sure why. Okay. Uh, there are two ways in which, uh, well, let me, there are two ways in which uh, you can diagnose personality disorder. One is the dsm 4 method, no different, exactly the same criteria. The other is a rather complex use of a basically five-factor model of personality as a way of diagnosing uh, personality disorder. You can't use it for all personality disorders, but you can use it for most of them. And uh, it requires a very careful attention to uh, very specific kinds of dysfunction uh, in identity, in interpersonal activity, in various kinds of personality functions, okay? And it's, you don't have to use it, it's located in the back section, the third section uh, of the DSM-5, but it's their bow to functionality. Uh, I, I know a fellow that was on the expert panel uh, for personality disorders uh, who was very upset because uh, the, uh, they worked out a, a much better schema which the APA uh, decided to ignore. And so they created something that's neither fish nor fowl okay, in terms of personality disorders. Then the paraphilic disorders and other conditions that might be the focus of uh, some kind of uh, clinical attention. Okay? And that's it for me. So does anybody have any questions? Did I do okay on time? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. I read this somewhere, maybe in the DSM. Is there a video, some kind of gaming disorder that's no. being monitored? No. Uh, there, um, there was some discussion uh, about including uh, internet uh, addiction or internet de dependence disorder or whatever they but were going to call it. it. No, it didn't make it in. Uh, uh, and again, this is one of those things that, you know, what, once you start talking about behavioral uh, dependencies, you know, where do you draw the line, okay? And so I, I would expect that we would see more of that rather than less of that, okay? Um, anything else? Okay, well, if not, time, yeah. we'll move on to the next presenter here. We're going to switch places here. My name is Tom Prout, uh, and I am um, primarily have been um, with the school psych program at University of Kentucky, but I've also been affiliated with HDI for a number of years. Uh, and just a little bit in terms of way of background and how I look at this. Uh, one is I've taught courses for years where I've used various versions of DSM. Um, always required of my students because I think it's something Good or bad, it's something you, you need to know about. Um, I've worked in the area of uh, intellectual disabilities for years, almost uh, my entire career. Um, but one of the things I'm going to bring a little bit of perspective to this, um, what I, uh, on a part-time basis over the last 20-some years, I've been a consultant for Social Security Disability. And what I do in that role, and I'm sure many of you have filled out forms, gotten requests from disability. Um, I'm one of the folks that sits in Frankfurt 
and reviews all your reports. I did this in the state of Florida. And one of the things that this has done is over the last 20 years, I have probably reviewed somewhere over 100,000 different kinds of reports from the reports that, that uh, disability purchases uh, that are called CEs. I notice we've got a couple community mental health centers online, uh, outpatient records, inpatient records, school records. Um, so I've seen everything in terms of different reports. And one of the things that this has allowed me to do over the last year is to take a look to see how we're transitioning and if we are transitioning from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Now, two issues I'm going to cover. Um, one is the um, just some general issues on DSM in general, including some of the critiques that have come out since uh, it was uh, introduced, I think it was in May when it, when it came out. You probably will notice a few things that I'll have some opinion on. So I'll, I'll try to label what's my opinion and what I've seen. But one of the things, again, I, that I, I think I've got a fairly good pulse on in the work that I do with Social Security in terms of what's going on in terms of practice and, and, and how this is, this is being used. Okay. Now, as I look around, at least the folks that are here, um, I'm not sure how many of you remember DSM-2. Now, when I started in the field, this is we use DSM-2. And let me give you a little facts on DSM-2. You really can't tell from the size here, but this is about a, a five by eight booklet. And I almost have to call it a booklet. It was originally 134 pages. Now we are at, <laughs> I feel like I should be church. Open your hymnals too. No. Um, we are at over almost 950 pages in DSM-5. DSM-2, as I said, was 134 pages. The diagnostic section that covered all the diagnoses was 38 pages. Now, there's a lot of critique with DSM-2. There were a lot of things that, that were written on. It was a lot easier to use. Now, I had a good friend um, when um, people were still using DSM-2. He was a clinical social worker in a community mental health center. Um, and my friend's name was JT. And I said, well, JT, how do, you, how do you use DSM-2? And what he would do is he would take DSM-2 with his clients, sitting across the table, give them DSM-2, say, thumb through that and see if there's anything you like. <laughs> now, ethics, good practice, I, I, I don't know. It was interesting. The clients at the time were very close in picking out diagnoses, and this is not a research study, but we're very close in picking out the diagnoses that the teams came up with. Now, think of taking this, sitting across from a client, say, take this home and read this this week and see if there's anything you like. Now, I, I can't imagine doing it. A lot of critiques with DSM-2, but having said that, um, we've, if, when DSM-3 came out, which was, I think, probably about half this size. It was this mammoth expansion of, of, of DSM-2. Okay. When DSM came out in, um, I believe the publication date is May of 2013. Uh, if you follow any of the critiques that were in uh, some of the psychiatric newsletters, this is more uh, thought pieces than, than research. It was not a happy beginning for DSM-5. There was a ton of critique. Um, DSM-5 was 14 years in development. And um, I see a couple of my students here. And uh, I'm not sure when you took the course from me, but I, uh, right around 2004, 2005, I'd say, look, I'm sorry I'm making you buy DSM-4 because the new one is going to be out next year. 
So 2006, I said, I'm sorry, I'm making you buy this. <laughs> well, it is now, it, it was four, 14 years uh, uh, later that it, that it came out. Now, one of the things that I've seen in practice um, are, are a couple things, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of them in, in, uh, in a little, little bit more detail. Um, I would say probably half to two-thirds, and this is a guess, I'm not counting them at my desk, folks are not using DSM-5 yet. They're still using the, the multi-axial system. Um, a lot of people still like the GAF, uh, which stands for Global Assessment of Functioning. I used to call it the guess about functioning. Um, and I, I think a lot of people have felt uncomfortable collapsing into the single axial system. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little, little bit more about that in, in, a, in a bit. Um, some of the critiques that came out, and I was interested in what you said to the person who was on the personality disorder. Uh, there was a lot of critique, and some of this is gossip. You know, it's not necessarily anything that, that uh, uh, people have, have solid foundation of. But one is that the task forces tended to ignore a lot of input from a lot of sources and that the task forces themselves were a lot less <coughs> inclusive of other disciplines, even though if you look in the back, there's a, a lot of the uh, uh, social workers, psychologists were involved in the, the field trials, but it seems to have a much more psychiatric and medical input than previous editions. And again, I, I would tend to agree with that, but I've also seen that written, written in a lot of places. Um, the non-axial or single-axis reporting, as I said, a lot of people haven't transitioned with that. And basically what we've got, instead of the, the, the five axes, we've got the four or the, all collapse into one. Now, in terms of practice things, um, a couple of things I've seen because the people who have been using DSM-5, they're also loading all of what used to be on axis three or the medical conditions onto axis one. And it's, it's, it strikes me as an awful lot of lumping. And from a practice standpoint, I, I saw a report the other day where their person had gone to an evaluation, there were one or two psychiatric diagnoses, and it listed over 15 medical conditions. And I think one of the things we have to be careful on as, as not being a physician is make sure that we're where that information is coming from. Because if you list it on a report and you say this person has uh, some sort of lung condition uh, and you sign the report, it, it's as if you're diagnosing it. Now what I always advise people to do is if you're going to list the medical conditions, either make sure it's clear in your report where that came from or where you're doing your listing. By patient report, by other medical records, et cetera. And I think potentially, if you're not careful in labeling that, um, they say, well, Dr. Prout, you're a psychologist, and you just diagnosed this person's cancer. And I go, well, it's a, it's a little side skill I have. Okay, <laughs> it's not. So you've got to be very clear in the, the, the specification of that. As Ted mentioned, there's been a lot of increase in the subtypes, specifiers, severity labeling. Uh, it is a much, much more detailed um, diagnostic procedure. And there's been a lot of criticism that it's been relatively imprecise in, in terms of some of the differences and whether they are real differences. Um, most diagnoses are made with probably a half an hour to an hour mental status exam and clinical interview. Okay. Can you sort through 900 pages and get all the information with that? Now, some of the instruments that, that Ted mentioned, I think, have some potential use. I haven't seen any of them used, reported, or very few. Let me, let me, let me not say any. So we haven't made that transition yet to using, I think, some of those, uh, some of those, those instruments. There are some structured clinical interview 
formats. Um, the one I'm most familiar with is, is the skid, which is about an hour and a half, uh, tied to, D, to, to DSM-4. Um, and um, it's cumbersome at best, but again, I don't see, it, see that being used uh, very frequently. Okay, an issue of reliability and diagnosis. We know, and I've looked a little bit of the, the field trials uh, and some of the, 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 the current literature, um, we do know from the literature in general is that we're pretty good at making diagnostic uh, differences between things like um, mood disorders and psychoses, <coughs> the broader categories. As we get more specific with severity, subtypes, specifiers, specifiers the reliability drops like a rock. So pretty good with the general areas, the more specific we get, the reliability goes down. What have we done with DSM-5? We've added a whole lot of specification. Now I do like some of the things, like you mentioned, with the major depression, with panic. Um, we know that the internalizing disorders are often hard to separate out. And uh, you know, one of the things I've seen, in, again, from practice, is I've seen people with 10 or more different diagnoses within a year by going to different agencies, et cetera. We also know that diagnoses uh, are more reliable with severe disorders versus the milder disorders. And again, when we look at people with mild depression, anxiety, mild, moderate, uh, it's, it, it's pretty hard to sort that out. Oops, I do miss my DSM too. <laughs> okay, um, some of the other um, critiques. Um, with some of the, and you mentioned they've lowered the bar in some of the areas, and I think there has been some criticism that with the changing of some of the standards that we have made uh, some things that have typically been generally within normal limits as now fitting into a cognitive or into a, a diagnostic category. The one where I've seen some things written about are mild neurocognitive disorder. Often as people age, memory goes. I probably won't be able to find my keys when I leave here, okay? Do I have mild neurocognitive disorder? Ask my wife, she might have a better idea, but no, I don't think so. But there's been some, some critique of that in terms of um, that, that we're making things that are typically just normal developmental processes into, into clinical areas. There are some of the newer disorders. Uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. I think there's good aspects of that and some less than good, I'll put it that way. The good is that I do think that it will probably reduce the number of kids who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, there's, there's been quite a bit written on the overdiagnosing of kids with bipolar disorder. Now, for those who have been in the, the field for a while, it was about 15, 16, 17 years ago, there was a book came out, uh, a book came out that was a little bit of a popular press, but one that a lot of professionals read, called The Bipolar Child. When that came out, diagnoses of kids with bipolar skyrocketed, okay? And it, to, in my opinion, probably inappropriate. So I think the good thing is that we've, we've got one that, that is, is probably a better descriptor. What we don't know is that this diagnosis sort of came out of nowhere. Very little research on it, and we don't know the, 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 whether there's a, a scientific uh, basis of it. And lastly, I'll hit on, on critiques. Um, again, with the way the pan some of the panels have been handled, what is the scientific basis of a lot of these different, different descriptors? Um, a lot of it is the, uh, I talk to people who know some of the workings of the various task, uh, the task forces over the years on the different disorders. And uh, uh, I know in particular when, when DSM-3 came out, which is the first major revision, it was basically a committee. 
the task force would sit around and somebody would say, I, I uh, like to nominate that we have, uh, of these nine criteria, uh, four would make the diagnoses. So they'd vote on it. Somebody would say five, okay. Really not that haphazard, but, but again, the, the real scientific basis is not, not real clear. Okay. Okay, changes in intellectual disabilities. Um, the uh, American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities uh, several years ago put out the, their a diagnostic manual where they changed to the term of intellectual disability. Um, unfortunately, that did not catch on. Uh, it probably did in, in facilities and institutions that were primarily for folks with intellectual disabilities. But in terms of the general practice, community mental health centers, et cetera, the term intellectual disabilities uh, did, did not really catch on. One of the positive things I think about the change, um, there's been quite a bit in the, particularly in the intellectual disability area, about the pejorative use of the word retard. Okay, walk down any middle school during between classes, and chances are you're going to hear that word. Okay, um, it's it's just it's it's uh, really become a pejorative descriptor in our uh, society. Then I was thinking back, and if you go back to the original diagnostic system that the uh, Intellectual Disability Association put forth, it was imbecile, idiot, moron. Those are all parts of our language. So I'm hopeful that with the use of this term that eventually the pejorative, uh, particularly the, the, the uh, the, the term retard is going to diminish. My guess is it's not going to disappear from our, our everyday language. And I've talked with several people and, and we've wondered, well, how could they take the term intellectual disability and turn it into a pejorative? What would be a shorthand for them? Hopefully uh, we, we won't go down that road. Um, the other part of the um, term um, is in the, in the category, it says intellectual disability, then underneath it, it says intellectual developmental disability. Okay, um, probably a bit of semantics, but when you look at the federal definition for developmental disabilities, it encompasses intellectual disability, but it's a much broader term. So there's been some folks who have questioned whether whether uh, that um, uh, is is something that that ought to be in there in terms of maybe confusing things. We've already talked. There's no longer uh, access to uh, the the definition depends on three domains: conceptual, which is basically the intellectual part of it, social, and practical. And it uses descriptive descriptors for mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And if you look in this little book, there's about three pages where they say. Here's what mild looks like in the conceptual domain, the social domain, and the practical domain. And it's about, probably a, a, a table that's about uh, two or three pages. And that's where the diagnoses of mild, moderate, severe, and profound are, are going to be based. Okay. It decreased the emphasis uh, on IQ. The IQs are no longer associated by mild, moderate, and severe, and profound. But part of one of the, the part of the definition is that there has to be an um, an IQ of basically 75 or below. They they say 65 to 75 and below as as a range. Okay, but there's no longer moderate is is 40 to 55 or anything like that. Um, they've also added a diagnosis called global developmental delay, very briefly described in there. But um, what this is really designed to do is to put a label on those kids who appear to have an intellectual disability prior to age five, but we're uncomfortable 
in really labeling it as an intellectual disability or previously to that with, with mental retardation. Um, for those who uh, have done testing with kids, uh, the research and our clinical experience, we know that getting an IQ on a three and a half year old is, is not necessarily predictive of, of, of later uh, uh, development. Okay. Um, now, as was mentioned, and is, is that the, the definition has moved more toward uh, assessment of functional abilities, okay, or adaptive behavior. Um, and I want to throw some, some cautions in with this, and I'll, I'll give you a couple examples late, later on in terms of where, where I think this, this uh, uh, comes, comes into play. Um, one is there are other reasons for adaptive deficits other than the intellectual disability. Okay. I've done a lot of work and done quite a bit of research in the area of dual diagnosis. Okay. Let me give you just a hypothetical case. We have someone with, let's say, an IQ in the 60s, major depression. They're immobilized. We look at function, and we label them, even though we've got an IQ in the 60s, with adaptive behavior in the severe range. Now, one of the things we all know that a lot of times in our records labels stay for a long time. Um, and, and a lot of times, uh, I've seen it, and this isn't a critique, in community mental health records where somebody has an initial diagnosis in a GAF <coughs> and it never really gets changed. It, it stays on there. Okay, so I, I've got, got my individual with an IQ in the 60s, but adaptive behavior in the severe range. Okay, now, first, being interested in dual diagnosis, when I see that kind of gap, that raises my dual diagnosis antenna, that there's something else that's going on. But we take this individual, they've got major depression, but we find a medication or therapy or whatever that works, and all of a sudden their function comes back. Okay, so were they really intellectual disability severe, or was it the, the dual diagnosis that was pushing that down? And does that get changed? So we've got to keep the idea of comorbidity in there. What about language disorders? Individuals with a discrete language disorder, and we look at the social domain. That's going to be different. Um, health status. We know, again, and there's, there's some research in the intellectual disability area, that when people with intellectual disabilities have chronic health conditions, their adaptive behavior is diminished. Um, with physical impairments, that can change, particularly things like mobility, community uh, access and interaction. Okay, so there can be other reasons for the adaptive measures uh, being lower or our, our functional assessment. The second thing is informant variance. Okay. Um, I know we've got a couple people working the schools here. Just for the group here, how many, how many, any others that work in the schools? Okay. One of the things I've seen is with adaptive measures, and good practice would say, get a parent, one or two teachers, et cetera. Okay. And I have seen adaptive scores be 50, 60 points difference um, based on informant. There's some research to suggest that some of the variants in our informant measures, including behavior rating scales for typically developing folks, uh, is related more to what's going on with the informant than necessarily the, the individual that they are um, providing the information on. So we may have some unreliable um, informants. We have situational variants, home versus school. And again, for those who work with kids, you've seen things where um, you talk to the, the school 
and the, the kid is fine. You talk to home, kid's terrible, vice versa, okay? I remember a case very early in my career came into a clinical setting, and this kid was all over the place. Nobody could control him. We couldn't do valid assessments. It was just terrible, terrible, terrible behavior. So we decided we better go out and do a school visit on this kid. So we go up to, to the school, and I'm looking around, and at first I can't find the kid. And he was perfectly behaved in school. Matter of fact, there were two or three, if I was going in sort of blindly and said, well, let me, the two or three kids that seem to have problems, this kid wouldn't have been one of them. So we see that kind of variance. Second kind of variance we see with kids is, uh, with Raiders, is special ed teachers versus regular ed teachers. One of the things I've always liked, and I'll say for our UK folks here, that I've always liked positively about the special ed program at the University of Kentucky is that the folks going through the teacher ed program there have a very positive view of promoting positive characteristics, attributes of, of the kids they work with. Um, and so, but they're also getting a different perspective. A regular education teacher may have a kid who's causing difficulty who might be just the middle of the pack in a special ed. And again, this gets into, again, uh, I've got it in the, the next line in terms of the bias, both positive and negative. Um, sometimes there's almost wishful thinking that somebody functions better in these things, or there may be some secondary gain for reporting the adaptive behavior lower. Context, urban versus rural, okay? Um, adaptive behavior for a kid in Louisville particularly in some of those community and, and practical things, may be much different from a kid from a small rural town. So adaptive behavior, and I, I like the idea on the assessment of function and adaptive, but it's, it can be sort of an elusive term. There's a lot of, lot of variance in there. Okay, another thing uh, in terms of the uh, uh, diagnoses is that um, They've essentially eliminated borderline intellectual functioning. When, and and it's, it's listed under, and there's been some critiques of the editing or lack of editing uh, in this. Um, when you find borderline intellectual functioning, as I was preparing for this, I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna, I wanna go see what, what's written in that. It took me half an hour to find where it was. It's not in the index, and it's this, Page 720 say this little little paragraph as a, as a V code, and for some reason they've got it listed under a heading of uh, non-adherence to medical treatment. It looks it looks like an, an editing error, but I, I I don't understand that. And I'll come back I'll come back to uh, uh, borderline um, in in a second. Um, one of the things I've seen with the the, the practice issues, uh, particularly in lack not really having borderline intellectual functioning as a, at least a, um, an apparent option is I've seen three cases recently with individuals with IQs above 70, one who had IQs in the 80s that were labeled either mild, moderate, or moderate intellectual disability. And my guess is that these are, are coming from, from folks who are probably work in general practice as opposed to with, with intellectual, uh, folks with, with intellectual disabilities. And my guess is that they're matching up that little tabular description. But the other thing is, as we make this transition, and we can talk about labeling, et cetera, all day long, but when, when I think of someone with a moderate intellectual disability, we're talking about somebody who's gonna need relatively good support, uh, probably some sort of a, a supervised living situation. And I don't think of somebody with an IQ in the 70s with that. So I think we're gonna have some, uh, as, as we look at these labels, we're gonna have to look real, and the, the DSM does recommend comprehensive assessment, but I, I think we're gonna have to look pretty closely in terms of what that's, uh, 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 what's involved there. Um, wide variation in assessment adaptive behavior, already mentioned, um, uh, that is an issue and the, the informants. 
Um, and in terms of one of in terms of uh, accessing services, uh, borderline intellectual functioning um, uh, actually still has an importance in the social security determination. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be allowed, but it is considered a severe impairment uh, from social security. Now, maybe some of, some of the rehab folks will. I have not seen anything in the VOC rehab guidelines that suggests there's going to be any change in the, the guidelines for eligibility at this point. Okay. Um, I also do not see anything in terms of uh, that in terms of uh, Social Security. Social Security has recently adopted the term intellectual disability instead of, uh, instead of mental retardation. There's no indications that they're going to move away from the, the criteria. And some of you may already be familiar with this. In terms of intellectual disability, um, you can qualify under a number of, of criteria. One is whether you have an individual who's uh, displaying almost total um, dependence and on others and essentially can't be tested. Um, an IQ below 60 has been generally, and I want to make sure I'm not speaking for the entire federal government on this, but has generally been an automatic assessment if the evidence is consistent. In other words, if somebody has a full-scale IQ of 54, they're typically an allowance in terms of Social Security. Um, IQ 60 to 70 with um, another severe mental or physical impairment. For example, the hypothetical that I said with an IQ in the 60s and major depression, it has to be a severe other impairment. Or if someone had another physical impairment that would be considered severe, um, that is typically an allowance. And there's some guidelines on what's non-severe and what's severe. And then the 60 to 70 um, individual um, with just severe functional deficits. Um, and, and in terms of measured by adaptive behavior or just, just other reports. Now, given that Social Security just recently changed to the intellectual disability and they have not come forth with any other guidelines, I foresee in the future that they're still going to be using the, the numbers, the IQ numbers as, as one of the, the uh, uh, primary criteria. Okay, that's all I have. Questions? For borderline intellectual functioning, there's no number given now, is that correct? It's, it's a little paragraph in, in the back. No IQ number. I'm no sure. IQ number. The, I'm pretty sure, the only thing they say is that there, there may be some difficulty diagnosing um, borderline intellectual functioning versus mild intellectual disability. And again, I think all of, the, all of us who, uh, uh, and I think the example you gave in terms of, we, we know folks who are just above the, that, you know, like a 73 and whatever the measure, but, but clearly function uh, in, in the intellectual disability area. But there's, there's no number attached to it. Do you know, um, like how they distinguish between disruptive mood dysregulation order and bipolar in children? I don't think we have enough experience with that yet. Uh, I, I actually, when I put that up there, I did a little little bit of a lit search on that. Uh, there there are different criteria, and I think when you when you read, uh, 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 and I think what Ted said is that I, I think they've they've tried to sort of describe it in a bipolarish way without labeling it as, as bipolar. Uh, and again, uh, one of the, the differential diagnoses that, that I see coming through a lot is, the, uh, is where the ADHD is mixed in as well. Um, but I, I, I haven't seen enough, uh, uh, matter of fact, in terms of that particular diagnosis in the, the, the kid cases that I've seen come through, I have maybe only seen that in one or two cases uh, so far. So I don't think we, we, I don't think we know how that's going to get operationalized yet. Their disruptive mood dysregulation disorder has some features in common with intermittent explosive disorder. I don't know if you've noticed that. 
And the main piece that I've been able to pull out between those two is that with intermittent explosive disorder, mood should return to normal range in between tantrums or episodes. And I, I think for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, mood is supposed to stay primarily Very irritable vulnerable. or negative all the time. So I've sort of looked at those two, and I don't give bipolar disorder diagnoses for kids, so I just haven't thought about that, and I've sort of focused on those two. I think maybe the intent is that fewer people... I, I hope that disruptive mood dysregulation disorder could be a, dis, could be a term that describes current behavior as opposed to predicting what forever might look like. And I think a lot of people have given bipolar disorder to a child and assumed that that was going to be a continuing condition. So maybe one of the, one of the moves here is to say, well, let's see if we can describe what's happening now and wait and see if we get true cycling later or, or what might be present later. So I am going to talk about the autism spectrum. And I'm not sure why autism in particular got such, such a big piece of the pie here. Maybe just because there was a big kerfuffle about changes in autism diagnostic criteria, do you think? Um, have you guys heard about some controversy over the last, uh, when, did the, when did the kerfuffle start? The working draft came out 2009, I think, summer 2009. I think that's when the real intense upset began because people went to APA site. I don't know if you, some of you may have done that. You could go on to APA site starting about then and see what they were proposing. And I don't know how the proposed changes relate to the final draft for the other disorders, but for autism spectrum disorders, it's been pretty close. What, what came out was pretty close to what they proposed. And people got upset about it. Do you know what people got upset about? Anybody? Hazelwood? I know somebody out there does. What did people get mad about when, the, uh, when that working document came out? They yes. dropped Asperger's. OK. That was probably, there were a lot of things, but that was probably the big thing. Yeah, um, I think Aspies had a big grassroots network. They had a big self-advocacy group. Who likes to be dropped? You know, none of us like to be dropped. If it's a diagnosis or a term, that it's a term that they had kind of taken for themselves and liked, and they didn't want it to be taken out. So that was part of it. We're, we're going to look at a couple of other smaller controversies too, but that was that was a big part of the fuss. And you know, I sort of been. I, I think part of that, it was they got lost in the system. Oh, here, you want to talk? Tell me, say more about it. Now Essentially, what happens instead of just having the diagnosis code change and the name change, we also wouldn't have it. Like one of the major controversies was that if you were of normal or higher intellectual functioning, you would have about a 50-50 chance of not being diagnosed at all. Whereas before, you would be solidly diagnosed under either mm -hmm. Asperger's or high functioning, you know, uh, what do you call autism. Mm -hmm. So I don't intend that to be true in my practice, but I hear what you're saying that the concern was, and we'll look at some research that looked at the impact of people with high IQs um, changing from DSM-4 to DSM-5. Good, good comment. Keep the comments coming. So objectives, well, I want you all to stay awake-ish, <laughs> unless you're so tired that you need a little nap, and in that case, that's good. But if, you're trying, if you want to learn something, I want you to be able to stay awake. I know it's late afternoon. Um, we want to be able to, I, some of you, how many already know what the changes are? How many have already looked at the DSM-5 and have read through the autism, the new autism stuff? I expected that a lot of you probably have. Maybe a few haven't, so I'll put them up here. We'll talk about what the American Psychiatric Association says is their rationale for that, and then we've already started to talk about the controversy a little bit, and then I'll show you some results from a couple of studies, or maybe more than, more than a couple. Um, so here are the diagnostic criteria. So we've got, here's another, um, this slide is going to show us one big change. We have dif differences in social communication and social interaction. Um, the DSM-4 had communication and social differences in 
two separate little sections, so you had to have, had to have each. They've been collapsed into one for the DSM-5, <coughs> and um, that kind of drives me crazy, not because I have the research to prove that it's wrong. I have just been thinking about uh, sort of three core differences in autism for about 100 years, and it's hard for me to switch. I think what they found was that when they tried to reliably distinguish between these two sets of categories, social functioning and communication functioning are so intertwined that they could not reliably pull them apart, and so they did not anymore. They put them together. And it's kind of funny. Some of you may know Bev Harp, who's a great social worker and self-advocate. Oh, hello. Mm -hmm. Some of you may know Bev Harp, and she and I have a long-standing argument about what's the deep core of developmental differences in autism. I think it's social. She thinks it's communication. And what is kind of cool about this is, yes, they, I guess they settled our argument by saying you're both. Yeah, we can both be happy. <laughs> so these are, to, these are all together now. You've got differences in social-emotional reciprocity. I won't read you all the examples there, although I could give you examples or talk about more if you wanted to know. Some of you probably have some pretty good examples. Um, differences in nonverbal communicative behaviors. Um, differences in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships. If you look, I mean, I, I've always thought and will always think that an important component of giving a proper autism diagnosis is the diagnostician's very deep experience with and knowledge of autism. There is no checklist that can easily do it for you. There is no measure that can easily do it for you. And when I look at these, it makes me think even more how deep experience and knowledge has to be Develop, knowledge of development, typical development, atypical development, um, just because they're, look at number three, think of all the ways that could look for a 14-month-old, for a 60-year-old that also has mood disorder. I mean, it's just really uh, fairly broad, and people have to make some of their own um, applications of it. So there are specifiers. I guess there are specifiers you've told us all throughout the DSM-5, and I think I've got some to show you. So this is my, I don't know, it's hard for me to pick a favorite. The conference but. is about to end. Hurry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had extra time. All right. So um, I, I don't know. I can't pick a favorite, but this is certainly um, a core difference in autism that I really value a lot and I think that offers a lot to the world. Um, the DSM-5 calls it restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. And you'll notice that when I go through these, the DSM has, and that's the DSM's right, it's going to call these deficits, deficits, impairments, I don't know, suffering. And I'm typically going to try to call them differences or unusual patterns because that's what they are to me. I'm going to have to ask the person or their family or their environment to see if they're causing, if these differences are causing distress. Sometimes they're bringing something wonderful to us. Um, so stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, what could these look like? Anything. Yeah, tapping or looking at wheels or your hands. Um, insistence on sameness and flexible adherence to routines, sort of ritualistic behavior. Humans tend to be pretty routine-based in general, and our friends with autism spectrum disorders may particularly thrive on routine and sameness. Um, Restricted fixated interests, I call these special interests or driven interests or strong interests. And a lot of times these are not only interests, but they're talents or skills that may go along with this narrow, high focus area. And then interestingly, the DSM put, um, 
It's, I think it's great that they brought in sensory differences and put it in the core characteristics, but they brought it into um, spe the special interest area. So you can have hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in <coughs> sensory aspects of the environment. I like that phrase. I mean, I don't know who determines if the smelling and touching of objects is excessive, but maybe if it's causing difficulty or interfering with the person doing something that they need to get done or that someone else wants them to get done, <laughs> probably more likely. Um, so these symptoms have to be present in the early developmental period. And I had somebody review, somebody smarter than me, review these slides for me, and then he said, well, what is the early developmental period? So I started to look, and I started to look in the whole DSM-5. It says early developmental period a lot. And unless somebody else sees something that I haven't seen, it really doesn't clearly say what the early developmental period is. So it's giving us a little bit of flexibility. I mean, obviously, it's in childhood at some point, but it's not, not as specific, maybe, as the DSM-4 <coughs> might have been. Um, symptoms have to cause clinically significant impairment in social occupation or other important areas of current functioning. These differences cannot be better explained by an intellectual disability or by general global delay. And if a person has intellectual disability, then they need to have social communication differences that are greater than their degree of intellectual disability that they have overall. And they need to have those strong and special interests as well. This is something, if you can see the red here, this is something that we're going to talk about later. Um, a couple of things. First, individuals with a well-established DSM-4 diagnosis of autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, or pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, should be given the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. I do not know if that was in the working document, but you can imagine why it's here, because people were very worried that they'd been getting services for 20 years under an autism spectrum disorder and maybe they wouldn't meet criteria and would suddenly be deprived of the services. So this is trying to get at that. The other interesting thing here is individuals who have differences in social communication but basically who don't have the special interest, restricted interest part, they're supposed to be considered for this diagnosis social pragmatic communication disorder. Do we have some speech language folks here? Uh, do you know if we have any in the audience? This goes under yeah. language disorders, and we'll talk about it more later. There, I actually read a critique on it by sort of a well-known speech pathologist, so I think there's some controversy about this social pragmatic communication disorder out there. Um, so here are some specifications. So if you recall, Asperger's disorder was given to people who did not have intellectual delays, right? That was one of the characteristics that you needed for that diagnosis. So you still have a specifier here, and you're able to specify with or without accompanying intellectual differences. I kind of like this being here because I think it's helpful to know people's overall cognitive development, to know something about that. And, and this sort of prompts people that it, would, it might be a good idea to assess that. You can also do with or without accompanying language impairment. I think most people would agree that it's a good idea to get language and communication information, evaluation information, assessment for people on the autism spectrum. So I think that makes sense, too. You say whether it's associated with a known medical or genetic condition, like Fragile X syndrome, for example, or with some other kind of neurodevelopmental, um, other kind of disorder. And then interestingly, um, catatonia has come in here. And I really haven't seen that. I, I, I couldn't even estimate, begin to estimate how many people on the autism spectrum I've seen over the years. And I've definitely seen one person with some outstanding and progressive catatonia, but it just hasn't been something that I've seen frequently. So I thought it was interesting that somebody in the, in the working group must have thought it was important that it be there. All right, so you can do the severity level, one through three. It's kind of like the intellectual disability little tables that we looked at. You can just look and see what seems to fit best. And as you pointed out, there are bound to be some disagreement between diagnosticians about which level a person falls under. So this is requiring very substantial support. Let's see. Level two is requiring substantial support. 
can't see it misspelling up there. I'd like to blame that on the DSM, but I'm not sure if I can. And then level one is requiring support. We have examples here. A person who can speak in full sentences and communicate, that has difficulty with reciprocal conversation, who may have difficulty making or maintaining friendships. So, Asperger's disorder, not in the DSM-5 anymore, right? Pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. Considered to many to be a plague upon the diagnostic world because it was confusing. People would get the diagnosis and then not be eligible for services with it, which was very distressing to families. Um, so that's also gone from the DSM-5. Brett syndrome, I think gone under the autism spectrum umbrella, but I assume potentially present as a medical diagnosis. And then childhood disintegrative disorder, which is a sort of um, late regressive subtype of autism that used to be in the DSM. I think that diagnosis was not given very often, um, so that's also been taken away. Um, and you might have heard of some of these terms, high-functioning autism, still out there, still will be used. I think Asperger's syndrome will certainly be used for a while, at least casually. Infantile autism, childhood autism, atypical autism, autistic disorder, all gone and replaced by autism spectrum disorder. So the APA says that the DSM-5 changes increase emphasis on the spectrum, the continuum of the autism spectrum, and certainly people have, professionals have been talking about the spectrum for a long time. So they see the, these changes as reflecting that it's all on a spectrum, and that's a big spectrum. They also say, I'm not sure if I agree with this, they say that they're diagnosed, that this, the new set of criteria increase emphasis on requiring characteristics of ASD from early childhood. Even if you don't notice the characteristics or the person doesn't seek a diagnosis or services until later, in retrospect, those differences should be there. So the DSM-5 feels that they have emphasized this more. So you would get at that through history? Mm-hmm. You know, the idea is that symptoms are going to be peaking, what, two, three, four years of age, maybe even a little on the early side of that. So the farther you get from that period, the more life the person lives, the more intervention they're getting, the more unique they're becoming, the more challenging it is to make a diagnosis. That's part of the emphasis on early diagnosis. But I think this is here to try to say, well, we can at least go back and see if that person appeared more classically autistic when they were a three-year-old. You know, video is useful for that too. Sometimes you can see somebody as an adult and think, you are an unusual individual. It is nice to meet you. Hello. But then if you look at video, because, you know, people nowadays, adults have videos of themselves when they were little kids, not like my generation. But young adults, you can look back and when they were three or four, there they are twirling, spinning, and doing a lot of the things that are a little bit easier to recognize as falling on the autism spectrum. So I think the retrospective part is important. Sometimes you don't have anybody to interview about what early developmental history was like, but sometimes you do. All right, so this is a study put forth by the American Psychiatric Association, and I can get you the whole um, reference list, and it actually may be on your PowerPoint if you downloaded it. Huerta at all. Um, this is basically um, APA's study that they wanted to put forth to show that the DSM-5 is not going to massively change the set of people that will get an autism spectrum <coughs> diagnosis. So they did, quote, <coughs> symptom extraction from previously collected data. Um, and then they, this study showed that the new criteria still identified about 91% of children who had had PDD. The spectrum used to be called the pervasive developmental disorder spectrum. Now it's called the autism spectrum. So about 91% of those PDD kids still had a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. That's what Huerta said. But Huerta did not remain unchallenged. People didn't just 
write, take a note, and move on with their life. People said, I'm going to look at that myself. I don't know if I believe it. So, oh, this isn't what I thought I was going to. Well, at some point I should talk to you about some different studies. Unless I skip them, let me go back. Sorry if I'm giving you whiplash here. Somewhere I've got some more studies to talk about. Let's keep going and see if I can get to them. So what's the APA's rationale for the changes that they made? I quoted for you. They believe that these new criteria represent a more accurate and medically and scientifically useful way of diagnosing individuals with autism spectrum disorders. And the work group believes that a single umbrella disorder will improve the diagnosis of ASD without limiting the sensitivity of the criteria or substantially changing the number of children being diagnosed. So, I don't know what I think about that. Let's learn some more. This is just a funny picture of uh, some people getting ready to get closed in the DSM. Who wants to be in the DSM? I guess you don't want to be in the DSM until you need something. Then you think, well, maybe I better be in the DSM if it's going to get me something. It's kind of a catch-22. So some of the criticism that the new guidelines have taken, three main questions. How about that transition from the three core symptoms to two? Some old people like me said, I like three. I've been using three for 20 years. And then the committee said, we don't care. You'll have to change. Um, creation of a single spectrum disorder rather than the group of related disorders that we had before. And then whether the new criteria are too narrow and are some people going to lose eligibility or some people that would have been eligible not be eligible for services anymore. So, okay, here's the other study I was looking for. So Fred Volkmar, who was one of the members, he, Volkmar was, if not the, he was certainly a major player on the DSM for uh, task force, you know, sort of creating Asperger's syndrome and that kind of work. So he was on this new committee as well, mostly because I think he was too powerful for them to not invite. So he was on it, and here he is collaborating with these other two researchers. They also reanalyzed old data. Um, it was DSM, they took DSM-4 field trials, and they saw what DSM-4 diagnoses people got, and then reanalyzed it based on DSM-5 criteria. Is anybody into this besides me? I, re <laughs> I really got into this. Maybe not so much for other people. Thank you for bearing with me. So remember the other figure was 91% of the people still got the diagnosis? Well, this study came up with 60% of the people. So lower number. And the interesting thing for them is that for people with lower IQs, about 70% of them met. For people with this kind of comes back to Karen's thought. For people with higher IQs, only about 46% in this study. So this was sort of a panicking study to a lot of people. And I, I guess I have to say, I don't think I believe the 91%, and I don't, I don't think I believe the 46% either, because I would be panicked if I thought only 46% were gonna retain, you know, retain eligibility for services. So they took this to APA and said, all right, you had that other study that said 91%, look at our study. And the APA said, no. We don't like your study. And I uh, believe uh, Volkmar then walked out. That's, he really got mad, and I'm pretty sure that he left. So he was really influential, and he still is influential. Um, he's the editor of JAD, but um, he got mad about the reception to his study. Catherine Lord, who's another really influential person in autism, she's the creator of the ADOS. She was on the working group, DSM-5 working group, too. And I think she and Volkmar must have had some differences. So she came in and said, I thought a pretty good critique. You can't use the DSM-5 criteria with information gathered from older versions because the DSM-5 questions weren't asked. DSM-5 questions are not terribly different. So I don't know. I kind of, I can see how they, they could go back and get DSM-5 information based on DSM-4 questions. I'm not sure if the questions are that different, but that's what she said. And she's actually done, then she came in and did a study, a more recent study, that went back to the original APA thing, which showed that most people were retaining diagnoses. So this has been back and forth and back and forth. She couldn't do it based on old data. How'd she do the study? She did use it on old data. I went back and looked to see if she did, because I saw that comment. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I assume that was all she was able to do quickly and at the time. She, I, I, I went to look to say, oh, did she get new data? No, she didn't. Um, so Johnny Matson, who's another, I don't know, very um, old and distinguished individual in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, he was on the committee, and, and it almost seems as if he was a mediator between the others. So he came in and said, look, why don't we just try to find out um, what happens to some of these people that may not get the diagnosis now? Why don't we see what their needs are? I think that's a very sensible approach. And he did one study, and I think is doing more, to try to look at if you were eligible in DSM-4, and if you're in that, what, mo what APA is claiming is the minority, a small percentage of people that w might not be eligible in DSM-5, are you still okay without services, or did this hurt you in some way, in which case, you know, I don't know what they're going to do about it at this point. And then Matson, he looked at, he's interested in um, really early, anybody here work in early childhood? <coughs> Matson actually has worked with adults some too, but he's interested in early childhood, and he, d he did a study looking at whether little guys kept their diagnoses under the new criteria. And I'm sorry to say that I don't have a percentage on there, but I know there certainly was a percentage of even little, little preschoolers that might have lost their diagnosis. Now, one of the things that we should talk about is that some of these um, sort of lost diagnoses or people that fell off eligibility didn't have an autistic disorder diagnosis to begin with. Some of them had a PDD-NOS disorder, which has long been a suspect disorder and sort of a confusing disorder. Some of them may not have been receiving services already because they had this sort of confusing disorder that may not have met service provision criteria. So it's not like people have jumped straight from having autistic disorder to having no diagnosis. I think a lot of those people that jumped off had this PDD-NOS, people were not entirely certain that they met criteria for an autism spectrum disorder fully, even under the DSM-IV. Okay, sorry to jump off the detail bandwagon on you on that. I, I wanted to let um, self-advocates have their say on this, or at least to reflect some of what they said. Um, GRASP is just one example of a highly articulate um, group of people on the autism spectrum who have a lot to say about everything, policies relating to autism. Um, be between the time that the working document came out and the time that the actual publication came out, they were extremely active in asking for independent scientific review of proposed changes by people that were not on the working group and um, doing risk-benefit ben analysis of the impact on clinical services and trying to find out what this would mean to people, you know, not clinicians, but humans. And here's a quote from the person that was the executive director at the time. Kind of an interesting. <coughs> the DSM committee members speaking to the media were Cup for a Lord and Dr. O'Brien H. King. King says no one will lose their diagnosis. Kupfer says we have to make sure not everybody who's a little odd gets a diagnosis of autism. It becomes a cost issue. So that person just came out and said what a lot of people have been thinking. And then Lord, here's Lord again, Catherine Lord, attempted to reassure people while not denying that some will be left out. Volkmar, oh there, yeah, there you go. Volkmar resigned from the committee. So that's what Michael John Carley said. I like the idea that at least, I don't know about for other diagnoses, I like the idea that for the autism spectrum, people who had received these diagnoses were paying attention to what the scientific community, clinical community was doing. So let's look at social pragmatic communication disorder. Who's heard of it? This exact title, I think, you t you're the speech path. This exact title is new, correct? It was pragmatic language disorder talked about before. So um, the idea about this is that it's going to be a lot of the social communicative differences that we see on the autism spectrum, but without the restricted repetitive interest. Now, I read a critique, and I actually wrote this woman's name, um, Tager Flusberg, who's a, a researcher that's done some big um, grant-funded studies on diagnostic validity for some different speech-language 
characteristics, and she had actually studied pragmatic communication disorder years ago in the 1990s. And so she, she didn't think, she doesn't think that this disorder should really exist separately. Her research showed that most people that fulfill the criteria here could actually go into either a specific language impairment or a language disorder diagnosis or on the autism spectrum. She's not sure if this is something separate from those two categories. So she doesn't like it. And she felt like, I think you mentioned this about some other categories, she felt like it was put in there without maybe the proper research backing. And she said she's going to be curious to see if it stays, if it goes. Um, so there it is, social pragmatic communication disorder. The implication that I heard is that people that would have gotten PDD-NOS would now get this. But it all depends on what their characteristics were like. To get this, they have to be special interest free to fulfill this quality. Oh, here's more. Just some more specifiers for that one. So I don't know how much we need to spend on this, just some informal characteristics associated with ASD. I thought we might talk about them briefly before we finish. We're getting close to finishing. Communication, anybody have any questions or thought? I have some things listed here that aren't necessarily written in the DSM, but that we might look at as, bless you, characterizing communication differences in autism, social interaction, differences in imitation. I don't know if this would go under social and communication, and now with the new DSM-5 it doesn't matter. Maybe this is a good thing. But um, changing a message or the delivery of a message to meet the needs of a listener I don't know if that's on my list, but I think that's a really good one for folks that are very bright. might still be hard for them to match their content or tone. They may speak to some kid in the playground the same way they speak to the principal when they've been called in on a rule infraction. That's not a good idea. It could get you in trouble. But it may, it may not be easy for them to perceive the difference in those audiences. Um, special interests. Gosh, narrow range of strong interests. Anybody have any great examples? Gosh, we have some wonderful artists who have great memory skills and a great drive to record. Now, I am spacing out on the guy's name. Who's the guy that does those wonderful panoramas? Have, have you guys seen this guy? Stephen, is it Stephen Wiltshire? Karen, is that right, Stephen Wiltshire? I think it's Stephen Wiltshire. If you haven't seen his work, look, you can look up Stephen Wiltshire, Rome. Stephen Wiltshire, Madrid. Stephen Wiltshire, he has been painting buildings in detail for a long time from memory, and that's what he spends most of his time doing. But lately, in recent years, um, people have seen what he could do, and so they fly him in a helicopter over whatever, Rome, Florence, wherever they are. And then he goes back to his location with a big, massive piece of paper and draws it, all of it. So just to show you, that's one end of what a special interest and a special talent can look like. And on the other end might be, or another place on that spectrum, might be somebody who loves to flip strings and the teacher has to make sure that there are no strings visible anywhere because if the person can find them, they will get them and flip them, even if they're attached to somebody. So there's just a huge spectrum of intense interest. But to get an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, you have to have <coughs> intense interest. Um, oops. I'm doing my Mac mouse instead of the PC mouse. Sensory differences. We have any OTs in the audience? Hopefully, OTs. OTs are good at looking at um, people being extra sensitive or maybe not sensitive, not as sensitive, so that they seek certain sensory experiences. Anybody have a good example or something to ask about with that? Sometimes you get picky eaters, super picky eaters. Can't just be French fries, but it needs to be Dairy Queen French fries cooked on Wednesdays after four so you can get pretty selective with what you'll eat and we have to work with those guys to help them be able to face some other kinds of foods or sensory situations um cognitive differences in cognitive learning styles 
sort of associated differences, although not core differences, but there certainly is research on learning style differences. Um, there can be some difficulty in attending to multiple cues or to general cues, rather some really good skill at narrowing in on certain um, more narrow cues in the environment, things in the environment. You can get language delays can get executive functioning challenges. Ah, oh, here's something I wanted to make sure and tell you guys. In the DSM-4, um, ADHD and autism were, were supposedly mutually exclusive, although in practice I didn't find that that was true. People would give both diagnoses sometimes. So the DSM-5 doesn't say that you can't give, give or have both of those diagnoses. So we know that there are executive functioning challenges present in most of people on the autism spectrum, but if you have that present to a very striking degree, if it's causing a lot of impairment, if there's strong inattentiveness, then somebody could potentially be evaluated for ADHD as well as autism. And, th and that was supposedly forbidden in the open. Everybody's yawning. Okay. Woo. Uh, I don't know why. This is the most interesting stuff in the world. I do not have any driven interest or repetitive interest myself. <laughs> you might be listening to me talk about one of mine. Next thing you know, I'll have my cat and dog pictures up here. I will, they, Matt wouldn't let me he, would not, he, he cut all the slides that had my other interests on them. <laughs> all right, so strength in rote memory, the ability to recall a lot of straightforward information, but maybe more challenges with working memory, which is why schedules are nice, schedules that go with us. So when we're going somewhere, we can look down and remind ourselves, I, I need this too. Oh, yeah, I'm going here. So that's working memory challenges, um, complex decoding kinds of challenges. Um, so we might have people that are really great decoders, but they're still working on developing that comprehension that goes along with what they can read. So sometimes decoding and some of those skills are in advance of, of some of the other comprehension aspects. Um, attentional difficulties or differences. Um, folks on the autism spectrum are really good at establishing a set, but once they establish it, they may have difficulty switching it. So however you want it to be, you might just set it up that way from the beginning because it might not be easy to switch it later on. Differences in joint attention and the delayed emergence of joint attention um, and short attention spans maybe, but if it's a topic of interest, a forever attention span maybe. They may have a short attention span for your topic of interest, but maybe not for their own. Okay, I think this is my last slide just to give you hope. So these are some co-occurring disorders. I mean, it could be anything in the DSM-5, anything, right? If we don't diagnostically overshadow, then we know that anybody with autism or intellectual disability could have anything else that any of the rest of us could have. But some of the common ones that I see in clinical practice, I have mostly, although not entirely, a clinical sample for people that I am able to know. And I see a lot of people with anxiety that they're dealing with, all across the age spectrum. Depression, um, from sort of older childhood, adolescence on, and sometimes our folks will get mood disorder symptoms for the first time in pre-adolescent kind of period, and maybe they never needed treatment for that until then, and then that comes, comes to them. Obsessive compulsive disorder, some of that compulsivity is a natural part of the spectrum, but sometimes it might be a bigger problem and they might get that diagnosis. ADHD we've already talked about, certainly can see tics, um, can see intellectual disability at some degree of a higher percentage than typical population. I don't know if anybody was studying back in the day when I was getting my degree, it used to be 70%. You, does anybody remember that figure? We used to say that 70% of people who had autistic disorder also had intellectual disability. And now that figure doesn't match our current population anymore. And by the way, I actually have a, throw this out as a question. So somebody had quoted, and I had seen a CDC study saying that our current um, prevalence rate, a current occurrence rate with autism is 1 in 50. But then I, before I came in here, I went to the CDC site where I always go and I saw 1 in 88. Does anybody know which of those is accurate? I'm going to go with a more conservative 1 in 88, but I, I'm guessing that we're moving toward 1 in 50. I, I wish I had this on a slide. I jotted down just so you could see some of the numbers through the years thinking about sort of holding the criteria steady or, you know, are we getting to the point where maybe we need to hold and, and not um, make our criteria any vaguer or more inclusive. 
So, um, and I'm not saying whether we should or should not, but I think the task force was wondering about this. So 1975, I tried to pick some markers that had personal relevance to me. 1975, I don't know what the relevance is of that. I was a kid. 1975, one in 5,000 people had autism at that point, were considered to have autism. 1985, that's when I graduated from high school, so I picked that. And that's one in 2,500 at that point. Um, then, I should have gotten 1990, but I didn't. 1995, just, a, just right at the cusp of the DSM-4 coming out, um, and when I graduated from my graduate program, that, it was one in 500 at that point, according to the CDC stats. 2007, I don't know why I picked 2007, just because it was kind of recent, one in 150. So now 2014, either one in 88 or moving maybe toward one in 50. So there's been some pretty dramatic change in the, the Centers for Disease Control's estimate of the numbers of people with autism spectrum in the population. So I think probably to some degree or the other that was on the mind of the task force when they worked on these criteria. And that's all I have. Questions, anybody? Question. Yes. What do you attribute, or researchers, what do they attribute the changes in numbers over time to? Well, nobody knows for sure, and a lot of people are arguing about it. We know that diagnostic criteria and diagnostic practices have changed, so those have changed and have become more inclusive. I mean, before Asperger's disorder was in the DSM, people really didn't expect people with typical cognitive levels to get an autism diagnosis. And even though Asperger's disorder is gone, I think that knowledge that these characteristics can be present in people with typical cognitive functioning levels um, is still with us. So definitely changes in diagnostic practices, and some people think some other type of either prenatal exposure or some sort of uh, maybe prenatal, a prenatal exposure that's a trigger to some underlying genetic vulnerability, um, complex, a lot of complex research going on on the topic. Good question. Do you think part of it's better guidelines for pediatricians to identify these diagnoses? Well, we've got the MCHAT, right? From the pedi years. Yeah, from, from previous. I mean, I think so. I, I just think, I think that maybe not necessarily just clearer criteria, but criteria that are more inclusive of a broader range of people. And remember when we looked at that social communication set of criteria there, could include a lot of different, you know, unique developmental patterns in there, I think. Anybody else? Anybody from a distant site? Have anything to say? Anybody awake at a distant site? Are you guys texting out there? <laughs> if you are, I hope you're texting you somebody. We can hear you. Um, yeah, I wanted to confirm the statistic on one out of 88. That's the one that I'm most recently familiar with. That's what I saw, too. Do you think I made up the one in 50? Am I starting an evil, I don't think so. you know, <laughs> gossip? But it could be moving in that direction. I mean, if you look well, let's, at how Let's stick with one. Thank you for checking on that. Let's stick with one in 88 for today. <laughs> Anything else? Ready for our next presenter? Hello? Yes. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, uh, could you speak to um, what effect that the, the increase in availability of funding for autism spectrum disorders may have, may have on increasing um, diagnosis in what could be considered borderline cases? What do you think? Jim? Well, I, I think, Obviously, yes. you have something to think about it. Tell, me, tell us what you think. We can hear you. Well, I think you, what you see is when you have an increase in funding, there's going to be an increase in the in diagnoses and along borderline cases yeah. Um, yeah. to get the support for individuals that they might not otherwise have uh, access to. And we've talked about that with ADHD, right? I mean, if there's no Ritalin or no research supporting that Ritalin does anything, if there's no 504 plan available or you can't get an IEP, 
why do you go see a doctor and have your kid diagnosed? Why, why should you add a diagnosis if there's no outcome to come out of it? So, you know, maybe we could say that for borderline diagnoses, but maybe we could just say that, and that may be true for autism. With ADHD, I think it's just true for diagnoses. Why get a diagnosis of ADHD, especially if you're a parent seeking it for a child, if you don't think that there's something helpful that can ha happen with your child as a result of it? So I think the same thing for autism. If you are, if your child has <coughs> level one autism and is doing okay, Maybe you want to get that formalized if you think they can get some more supports, or maybe there's something that you think that they need in school, and you know somebody else's child who's gotten it, and you hope you can get it. It really does make sense for you to seek that diagnosis. I think, I think that's a good human impulse, um, and wouldn't necessarily be. I think sometimes when we think about cost containment and cost issues, we're assuming that everybody's going to need super intense need and want super intense services. I think sometimes for. Oh, good. I'm glad you guys are still out there. I think sometimes for people on those sort of borderline ranges, you know, it, it might be a quite an expensive, very minor service that would make a huge difference in their ability to get a job or to live independently. Um, and if we give good intervention all along, we may be able to prevent some of the co-occurring disorders that come in and further disable people from having good quality of life. So. I, I think I, it's a really good question, and I wish we had time to argue it more. I'd, I'd love to hear what more people have to say. I guess we should move to depressive and personality disorders. I don't think that's going to work. We should say that Christy I, is having some. An expressive. She's having some she vocal saying. volume issues today. So um, I'm very thankful to my friend Tony Lobianco to be my voice today. Yes, sorry. We were office mates for a while, and I thought I could read her mind. I'm not sure if I can read her handwriting. Um, but I'm going to do the best on both regards, and she'll smack me if I say anything wrong or um, don't say anything that she wrote. So um, coming from Christy, and ask us questions, and she'll whisper answers in my ear, and I'll relate them to you. Um, Christy is a licensed clinical social worker in private practice in Lexington. She has four children aged one year to 18 years. Uh, and being a mom is her favorite job. Uh, for this final section, uh, I was charged with discussing the impact of clinical work as well as briefly touching on both depressive disorders and personality disorders. Um, a, a note before we start is that DSM-5 becomes, quote, active on October 1st of this year. Um, it's out now, but third-party reimbursements and agencies need time to adjust and update their systems. Um, I have to inform the other presenters that my daughter, her daughter, uh, has unofficially diagnosed them with APHD. Uh, this requires a bit of explaining. I was lamenting the fact yesterday evening over dinner with my family that I was feeling nervous about this presentation because I was the only one without a doctorate. My daughter heard, I'm the only one without APHD, and she envisioned me on a stage with three behaviorally disordered individuals. <laughs> and that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies. My apologies, I should really say three individuals with behavior disorders, or I may lose my HDI affiliation for not following the use of person-first language. Um, I am proud to share that I worked for HDI for four years as a research assistant with a great office mate. It was me. Um, um, and it is very nostalgic for me to be here today. Thank you, Mary Beth Valance, for the invitation to join this panel. Okay, you can see the basic structural changes. Do you want me to... Read these or just the notes. Okay. Um, Dr. Gladowski uh, shared much of this information on this slide with you in the opening of this panel presentation, but I thought it might be helpful to offer a brief review as well. I won't belabor all of the points, but emphasize those that most significantly impact clinical practice. It is helpful to remember that the changes in the DSM-5 represent a researcher's dream, but a clinician's nightmare. Increasing the complexity and specificity of mental health disorders offers researchers the opportunity to identify sets and subsets of the population for further research. However, that same complexity and specificity presents some challenges in direct clinical practice. Let's briefly run through the structural and diagnostic changes and discuss the benefits and challenges. Structural benefits. Um, Coordination with the ICD-10 allows mental health providers to keep up with trends in the medical field, not only domestically, but internationally. 
work is actually underway for an IDC 11, but at least the coding in the DSM-5 will bring us up to the, the, what we need currently. Arabic numerals allow for the more frequent revision with a decimal point, i.e. 5.1, um, potentially even an online revision between print versions, or frequent online revisions between print versions. Uh, this could challenge clinicians to maintain a continuous vigilance to ensure accurate coding for reimbursement and potentially offer more loopholes for insurance companies to deny claims. <clears throat> Diagnostic benefits. Um, following the trend of mental health parity legislation, the verbiage change in the DSM-5 from differential diagnosis from medical disorders to other medical disorders uh, fosters the understanding that mental health disorders are medical disorders too. This allows for the reduction in stigmatization and could possibly encourage more individuals to seek treatment who would otherwise not do so. Being able to more accurately diagnose with increasing specificity allows for more detailed research. If we understand that individuals diagnosed with major depressive disorder are at an increased risk of suicide, we can take more clinical precautions. If we know how individuals with major depressive disorder with anxious distress differ from those with traditional MDD, we may learn how to more effectively provide intervention. Research informed us that it was precisely when depression appears to be improving that individuals are at the highest risk for completing a successful suicide. All clinicians bemoan the overdiagnosis of bipolar disorder in children, and the newly included disruptive mood dysregulation disorder will offer a more accurate, le more accurate, lesser severe diagnostic option in many cases, which will alter treatment, hopefully, in the reduction of use of serious psychotropic medication on a vulnerable population with brains that are still in the formative stages. Challenges to clinical practice. Um, we like to think that we are objective observers and accurate diagnosticians. However, there is a level of subjectivity in differential diagnosis that presents issues for practitioners. There are no blood tests or bio, bio, ah, sorry, biomarkers for most mental health diagnoses. Clinicians rely heavily on client and family reports, collateral information from other providers, and clinical observation. However, if you ask 10 therapists to complete a psychosocial assessment on the same individual, it's very likely that there will be significant variance in the resulting diagnosis. When considering that diagnoses are intended to guide intervention, this can be life-changing for an individual who is recommended to pursue individual insight-oriented talk therapy, therapy, group dialectical behavioral therapy, a potential cocktail of psychotropic medications, electroconvulsive shock therapy, or some combination. Losing sight of context with the loss of AXIS-4 may also contribute to significant change in diagnosis and treatment. If we have a four-year-old who cannot attend to academic tasks at school, is disruptive and bouncing off the walls in the classroom, and refusing to follow directions at home, an inexperienced clinician may quickly jump to the conclusion that this child meets the criteria for ADHD. However, if one were to look a little deeper and discover that the same child was regularly exposed, exposed to domestic violence at home, Prior to a recent removal, one would understand that this child could be experiencing the effects of trauma. This distinction significantly alters the course of recommended treatment. Third-party reimbursement mandates an immediate diagnosis, rushing the differential diagnostic processes and preventing a thorough evaluation. This is not a challenge unique to the DSM-5, but a more universal one. Accurate assessment takes time and relationship, things that 25-page intake forms with hundreds of checkboxes do not allow for. The DSM-5 in particular is so complex and specified and inclusive of what was previously sometimes considered normal human experience that it becomes difficult to identify individuals who would not meet criteria for something in the DSM-5, my family included. Um, two out of six of us may meet criteria for premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, along with 51% of the world's population. My husband would frequently be in caffeine withdrawal, and four of my children would regularly meet criteria for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder because they are teenagers and toddlers. The hudas, how do you pronounce that? Hudas. I was right. Hey, hey. Um, it's a thoroughly and potentially useful tool, however, it does not lend itself to promoting the type of therapeutic rapport and alliance necessary to promote change. In fact, like so many other forms and too much paperwork, 
It can be counterproductive and may explain why a good percentage of new clients do not return following an intake appointment in agencies that demand such. More diagnosis equaling more medications is obvious. When considering the influence of pharmaceuticals in the development of the DSM-5, it doesn't take a paranoid schizophrenic to consider the potential motive and worry about the outcome. Here is a recent example of the required coding correction due to typos in the DSM-5. Say about that. It speaks for itself. All right. And we forgot to include childhood as a disorder. Uh, this slide was borrowed from Dr. Jerome Wakefield from a recent presentation he gave at the Winter Conference for the Kentucky Society for Clinical Social Work back in November. It is more than a bit tongue-in-cheek, but... I like the legume anorexia. <laughs> I like the whole thing. <laughs> Immaturity. Uh, what about sleep? Um, obviously, I am using sarcasm to illustrate my ultimate point um, that many people do not need diagnoses. They need healthy relationships. In fact, I would go so far as to stipulate that many of the diagnoses detailed in the DSM, any generation of the DSM, similar to the DSM-2 perhaps, um, stem from relational issues such as insecure attachment relationships with primary caregivers in early life. But this would result in a very slim DSM. Ah, that's where I'm supposed to say slimmer, similar to the DSM-2 perhaps, uh, with intervention focused on ra relational therapies that do not require medication. So I may remain in the minority on this issue. Questions. Do you have any questions? It might be hard for me to respond, but... but I can wing it. I can just totally make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> um, depressive disorders. Um, we know that nature and biology do play a part in depression that there can be a genetic predisposition in families. I wouldn't want to rule out the impact of learned behavior, but the research on depression is well established. This slide represents changes to the section on depressive disorders in the DSM-5. Don't mean to read this slide. Okay, um, so just reading from the slide, um, new specifier considered for major depressive disorder with anxious distress, um, irrational worry, preoccupation with unpleasant worries, trouble relaxing, feeling tense, fear that something awful might happen like losing your voice before you have to give a presentation. Um, addition of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, addition of premenstrual dys dysphoric disorder, uh, addition of persistent depressive disorder. Can we speak about this being an upgrade from the back of the book to the front of the book? Ah, yes, I'm supposed to mention that um, the addition of the premenstrual dysphoric disorder is an upgrade from the back of the book to the front of the book. Now, can anyone tell me what that means? <clears throat> I can't either. Oh, I was hoping someone could. In the DSM-4, the back of the book had uh, conditions requiring further study. And in the DSM-5, uh, premenstrual dysphoric sy syndrome was promoted up to the big kid's table onto, uh, in, into the regular diagnosis. A good friend of mine said that uh, they should have come up with, uh, what would he call it? Um, Testosterone deficient dys dysphoric disorder for men. <laughs> if we can make a parallel, that in DSM 5, section 3 is like the, old, the back of the book, where with conditions for further study. So DSM 5, section 3 is like the back of the book with conditions for further study. So there's still a set of conditions for further study in the new. That, that didn't make it to the big kids' table, but. Yeah may at some point in the future. Um, just read this. Sure. Okay. Um, major depressive disorder, uh, a leading cause of disability in the U.S. for ages 15 to 44. Um, five of the nine symptoms have to be present for more than two weeks. No. Okay, re required for a diagnosis is that five of the nine symptoms have to be present for more than two weeks. Um, do you want me to read through all these? Not necessary. Okay. Well, you can read them. 
Uh, bereavement exclusion has been excluded from the new DSM. Um, elimination of the bereavement exclusion. Uh, the argument for doing so is that the risk of suicidality with underdiag risk of si suicidality with underdiagnosis. Missing people who might otherwise meet criteria. Oh, missing people who might otherwise meet the criteria. Um, major depression is a potentially lethal disorder with an overall suicide rate of about 4%. And research has demonstrated that the highest risk of successful suicide is exactly when clients begin to improve. Um, the argument against doing so is that it may pathologize normal experience. Um, grief may last for many months and there may be other life stressors that I guess just get you a diagnosis when you really right. aren't suffering from that. If you think about the nine, <coughs> five of nine symptoms, people experiencing grief and bereavement will qualify for this for much longer oftentimes than two weeks, sometimes upwards of a year or even two. And so to um, potentially lump them in with an MDD diagnosis may, may or may not be appropriate, but it's important to understand the distinction. I'm so sorry for my voice. Other life stressors, um, loss of a job, loss of a relationship can also have a similar impact. Um, and it is foolish to think, if you think about it that way, that you only get two weeks, you know, to adjust, to, to recover, to loss of a job, spouse, whatever, major stress. Personality disorders um, represent an, quote, enduring pattern of inner experience and behavior that deviates markedly from the expectations of the culture of the individual who exhibits it. Um, these patterns tend to be fixed and consistent across situations that are typically perceived to be appropriate by the individual even when, um, even though they may markedly affect their day-to-day -day life in negative ways. Um, so people who meet criteria for a diagnosis of a personality disorder wouldn't the thumb through any DSM and pick that out for themselves. Sure. Okay. Uh, in the DSM-5, personality disorders upgraded to Axis-1, but categorical criteria remain the same. Um, among adults, American adults, age is 18 and over, an estimated 9.1% have a diagnosable personality disorder with the most prominent being avoidant, borderline, and antisocial PD. Uh, there's considerable evidence of overlap between the categorical PDs. And dimensions versus category categories proposed in Section 3 for further study See alternate DSM-5 for a model for personality disorders. So the alternate model is in section three, not yet at the big person's table, big kid's table, but it's considered for further use, much like premenstrual dysphoric disorder used to be. Uh, it says the big text on this slide represents the formal categories of personality disorders. Um, in, what's that? It looks white. Oh, it looks white there. Yeah, okay. So the white text on this slide represents the formal categories of personality disorders in the DSM-5 compared to those currently existing in the DSM-4-TR. So you can see there are fewer categorical uh, diagnoses than compared to DSM-4. Um... As with many sections, there was considerable dissent among members of the committee charged with the review of personality disorder. Uh, historically, additions to the back of the DSM often are upgraded to the main section in the next edition. Um, the hope here was for both sections to be useful for research and clinical work. Personality functioning and personality traits are helpful indicators even without a diagnosis of personality disorder. Oh, okay. Um, allows for the. Is that so the one? Section three allows for. S section three. Uh, it, it allows for the understanding that there's often, we could say, a comorbidity of more than one personality disorder or traits that are mixed between them, and it's tough to pin down what categorical diagnosis. Um, and, and there's a significant overlap in section three allows for that because it is more of a. Um, um, kind of a spectrum, kind of a, um, with lots of different traits. 
So in the old version, you had to pick one, but now you can assign multiple ones. Is that the? You can you can have straight, uh, trait specific personality disorder and and pick the traits um, that that are most applicable that are fit. I'm stumbling on my words and my voice there. You can pick trait specific personality disorder traits, right? <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to know anything about post-school outcomes for people with disabilities, you can ask me later. <laughs> I do actually know something, just not this. Not this. <laughs> this, is, um, this is all section three in the back of the book. This is not currently in the DSM-5 section two where we get our official diagnoses, but this is the new stuff for personality disorder that is under um, consideration. So criterion A for a level of personality functioning um, in terms of self, identity, experiences oneself as unique with clear boundaries between self and others, and self-direction, pursuit of co coherent and meaningful goals, and on the interpersonal um, empathy and intimacy. Read what those mean. So we think about those as kind of protective factors for uh, typically developing individuals and the opposite of those things would be uh, examples of, of dysfunction, um, for lack of a better word, according to personnel um, criteria. All right, we have criterion B, pathological personality traits. It's a five-factor model, um, which Dr. Gladaski referred to earlier. Um, each trait offers multiple distinct variants. So what does all of this have to do with rehabilitation? I'll ask you now. I'll tell you what this all has to do <laughs> with rehabilitation. Uh, Dr. Prout mentioned having reviewed about 100,000 disability determination requests um, and reports. And I wonder how that number may increase after the DSM goes into effect on October 1st of this year. Um, so Oh, i.e. adult ADHD, as mentioned by Dr. Gladaski. DSM-5 grandfathers in those previously diagnosed resolve the problem for special education. Uh, there's a note that says those who receive services will not lose them. DSM-5 will reduce the number um, of kids diagnosed with ASD going forward. Right. Consistent with what you were stating? I think so. It might or it may. Food for thought. Um, increasing the population of people considered to have a disability increases the strain on a service system structure that is already struggling to provide adequate access to quality care. Hmm. Um, okay. Um, According to the National Institute for Health, about a quarter of the American population meets criteria for mental illness at any given time. With DSM-5, plan on seeing an increase in individuals with diagnoses. Um, okay, diagnostic codes are a means to third-party reimbursement that can facilitate research, but those very same labels potentially have lifelong impact. Um, it says the, the DSM is a guide and a helpful tool. Um, how, uh, but, but not a Bible. That, Bible does not have updated editions, um, but with the DSM, if it's not included now, it might be included later, um, and vice versa. Um, a later bullet there, getting both closer and farther from the truth, uh, depending on your perspe perspective, um, strong advocates and strong critics. Anything? For the changes or against the changes in the DSM? According to any diagnostic label. Oh, okay. So strong advocates and strong critics of the DSM itself. Changes. Yeah. Changes in the in the DSM. Um, okay. Uh, keep in mind that all diagnoses are variants of normal human experience. Oh, um, related to clinicians need to have a thorough understanding of the multifaceted implications of changes to the DSM. Um, it is important to keep in mind that all diagnoses are variants of normal human experience. Um, there must be evidence of personal distress and distress and interpersonal 
functioning. Um, labeling is concrete and, and can become self-fulfilling prophecies for individuals, and labels can pre, pre exist Precede, Precede uh, the reputations of individuals. So in, in that I mean, in the clinical work that I do, if I meet with someone who meets criteria for de of depressive disorder, the fact that I say you have depression can influence their in internal experience and they can become even more depressed just by knowing they meet criteria for a label. Um, it, it, the, the other statement there, that labels precede individuals. Their labels and their um, reputations just by their label can sometimes pre precede them and produce pre prejudice um, in, in a variety of settings. So I think we need to be very careful um, before we label an individual with any diagnosis. Y'all hear that? Good. Um, clinical recommendations. Uh, remember, research has demonstrated that effective intervention is 80% relationship and only 5% technique. Uh, remember, the medication is not always the answer. Uh, but, and let's be practical, use codes and labels for research and reimbursement as accurately as possible, but avoid over-labeling and over-diagnosing. Um, when it comes to treatment, there is a qualitative difference between saying, tell me your story, uh, versus there's a pill for that. And finally, uh, let's keep in mind that the goal of treatment is not to be devoid of all unhappiness and distress, and that normal human experience includes both positive and negative emotional experiences. I read the quote. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So if you have questions, really, we'll do our best to, to relate and translate. I think that this slide in particular, I think we as humans need to understand the, the spectrum of experiences, positive neg and negative. We can't truly appreciate the positive without experiencing the negative, and if we try to remove that um, from human experience, um, what's left? Um, do almost, almost nothing. And when and, and to, I work a lot with um, parents of young children, and a lot of times parents, I think, um, I say a lot. I don't mean all, but oftentimes try to prevent any kind of discomfort or distress or frustration for their children, and it doesn't give an adequate experience of what life in the real world is really like. We, we do a disservice to our children sometimes by, um, by um, sheltering them, by overprotecting them, and by preventing negative experiences. And, and so when uh, we have kids who haven't had the opportunity to, to um, be in the real world, um, hit 18, um, and, and to look at their life on a textbook, it looks beautiful. And yet these kids are feeling depressed. Uh, and so um, I think I, it really behooves us as clinicians and parents and teachers to um, let kids know and help remind ourselves that uh, it is normal for us to feel sad and angry and dis disappointed and frustrated at any given time, any given day. In adolescence, you're, you're, the situation doesn't even necessarily have to be congruent uh, with your mood because of all of the chemical, biological, physical changes that are going on in your body. And, and kids oftentimes feel like there's something wrong with them. And if we give a bad diagnosis, we are basically saying, you're right, there's something wrong with you that's broken or needs to be changed. And sometimes it's just typical, normal developmental experiences. And, and I think we need to not lose sight of that. So I apologize again for my voice. Thank you for bearing with myself and with Tony. I am so grateful for your voice today. Uh, it was fun. Um, I learned stuff. Um, <laughs> so we can open up questions to any of our four panelists if anyone has come up with any. Illnesses or brain disorders. Is there any research lately on personality disorders? You know, are they considered brain disorders or are they thinking they're more social, personal, maladaptive behaviors? 
Um, let me back up one step. Uh, there are certain biases that say that mental disorders are brain disorders, okay? The problem is that our current state of knowledge using things like functional MRI or single photon emission computer-aided tomography, we don't know whether we're looking at the causes or the consequences okay, of a disorder. Secondly, uh, we know that brain and behavior is a two-way street that the brain generates affect, behavior, processes, information, sensation. We also know, especially from the work of people like Bruce Perry, how profoundly the brain is affected by experience. Okay. So it's a two-way street. It's not either or. So it, 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 to answer your question as best I can, for some personality disorders, like antisocial personality disorder, we can measure differences, for example, in prefrontal functioning. Okay? Individuals who have any social personality disorder tend to have lower levels of prefrontal functioning, which means that you know, if I use a, if I tag oxygen with a, with a tag and then I use, let's say, a functional MRI or single photo, better yet, single photon emission tomography, that I can see that the frontal cortex of this individual as any social personality disorder is not metabolizing as much oxygen as, a, as an individual without that disorder. So that area of the brain is less active, you know, at this moment in time, okay. Is that the cause of um, antisocial personality disorder, or is it the result of a series of, you know, perhaps genetic vulnerabilities linked together with traumatic experiences that led this individual to be antisocial, and therefore, investing less in the activity of the prefrontal cortex. So it, it, that, that's where we are right now. Uh, there, there are some people that hope that maybe one of these days we'll be able to, you know, have biological markers in terms of use of these kind of instruments or maybe instruments that we don't even know about yet <coughs> to do that. But as of right now, we're like Louis Pasteur the day after he got his microscope. You know, he put a drop of pond water and looked in there and he said, oh, mon dieu, look at it, there's a whole invisible world in there. I wonder what those little creatures do. You know, that's kind of where we are right now. Any other questions from anyone? What time is it? Because <laughs> I have a question for the audience. I just wanted to ask you, so having heard all this, I wanted to get some feedback from the audience in your practices or whatever capacity you work in, what, what are the diagnostic changes that you think will impact you the most or that sort of struck you the most as you listened to the presenters today? Can be The changes in the autism spectrum, most definitely, um, with Ashburners changing, with RETS being taken off, um, those definitely are going to be changing a great deal of the clients that I work with. What, who else? What else? I think classifying severity levels um, and using the system that they have now and have come up with is going to be a change. Yeah, just figuring out how to do it. What else? Dr. Bundy. Bundy. Yes. We're curious. Um, we're school psychologists and we're curious. Hey, it's Melissa. <laughs> Um, we're curious how quickly the state eligibility criteria is going to fall in line with the DSM-5. Good question for Dr. Crow. What do you think? Soon? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually think, uh, in, in particular looking at the intellectual disability area, um, it's probably uh, preceded DSM-5. I mean, they changed the labels. Uh, Etc. So I, I don't think uh, it's going to drastically change that. What, one of the concerns I would have um, down the road, and I, I think the criteria is sort of loose now anyways, is you mentioned that the ADHD bar is being lowered. And one of the things I've seen being involved in the schools for years, uh, the increase in OHI uh -huh. uh, has been almost as dramatic as the increase in, in autism over, over time. Um, I, th I think a lot of times, probably with, um, uh, it'd be interested with the disruptive mood dysregulation, whether that's going to 
get kids services mm -hmm. under OHI or whether it's going to be an EVD qualifier. And again, with the schools, uh, it, it, it's always it amused me when I've seen cases where you have a kid who's in uh, emotional and behavior disorder classes and there's no evidence of any kind of a DSM diagnosis. So we're saying this, this kid is serious enough to be placed, but, but there's no evidence of, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure a diagnosis is, is necessary. But uh, as it stands now, it's really under, under uh, OHI where, where we really look at, at DSM currently. So I wouldn't anticipate a, a huge rush to changes across states. Um, and, and again, with, in, with intellectual disabilities, uh, it's, it's interesting when you look at the different states, and I think it's becoming more consistent, um, states still use different terms. For example, in Ohio, they use the term cognitive disability. <laughs> And I was, I was attending uh, some workshops up there several years ago, and the folks, it was in Ohio, it was in Columbus, and they kept talking about the kids with CD. I kept thinking communication disorder. Well, it's cognitive uh, disability. Uh, so I, I would say DSM is sort of catching up a little bit at this point. The thing that, the thing that I'm most excited about with the differences in the intellectual disabilities is that they're, from what you you explained today, there's going to be more emphasis on the adaptive deficits. And we have so many kids that, based on eligibility criteria, they miss the mark by just a small amount on the cognitive scores, say for MMD. But yet, adaptively, they are not functioning in the classroom, but we can't qualify them. Yeah, I, I personally would like to see a little bit more of that uh, plus or minus uh, in, the, in the MMD, I think. In the MMD. Uh, yeah. Because then again, it's a pretty strict criteria, although what I've seen in, with a lot of kids, again, as they get older, they don't necessarily, and if the kid qualified with a 68 and they come back for uh, reval in three years and the kid's got a 71, I, I see a lot of those kids being retained. Uh, anyways, mm -hmm. uh, because it does come down to the ARC decision uh, mm -hmm. uh, in general, and I don't see the state going in and saying, oh, you, you've got kids with 72 IQs in here, uh, et cetera. But th there really should be an increased emphasis on the functional and adaptive assessment, but it's also, you have really have to, as I said earlier, really have to took the look at the validity of it and, and that it matches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I work with uh, <clears throat> severe and persistent mental illness. Um, so I think, you know, some of the changes in the um, schizophrenia spectrum is going to be interesting to deal with, but I thought it was interesting with the mood disorders, you know, well, having OCD move to its own thing is interesting. Um, but um, it looks like you know, diagnosing um, major depressive disorder now won't be comorbid with anxiety a lot, it will be major depressive disorder with anxiety features. And so I think that might be one of the kind of pragmatic things that ends up having, <coughs> saying, having, two, different of having two different diagnoses and then making that clinical judgment, which is actually causing the greater impairment. You know, uh, is, it, is it just with features? Is it its own distinct disorder? Um, I think that's going to be one of those challenges. I think the specifiers are nice when it's this is the hint or the trend that the disorder has, but but sometimes it's, it's I don't know, it's almost too helpful, right? Yeah. It's so specific. And and I, I realize that, you know, the client and I, we, you know, we drive treatment, and so we decide which element of the the goal that we want to focus on. So I guess, yeah. pragmatically, in the session, it doesn't matter if I write down depressive disorder and anxiety features or depressive disorder and social phobia. But you know, and if, if they do uh, want to, I mean, we have uh, clients who uh, apply for disability, you know, and is having these specifiers going to make an, an important difference in your disability? Uh, well, sure. yeah, so those are kind of the concerns that I, I have. What is your name? 
Frank Schneider. Frank Schneider. I can speak to that a little bit of disability. Thank you, Carl. I don't work down here. I work uh, you don't get extra parts by having more guys. Yeah, well, I think part of it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, yeah, it's the severity. Does the severity of the anxiety get revealed in the fact that it's a specifier rather than being a separator? No, because it, you, you have to have an impairment mm -hmm. that would in all likelihood yield uh, enough deficit where it would for uh, Social Security mm -hmm. that would get in the way of working. Okay. Yes. So it really, we're, we're, you run into inconsistencies where you have somebody who would say, let's say, this person has mild depression and there's alleging or claiming all these limitations. It's really once they have the, the diagnosis and if it's reasonable that it could produce the limitations, then it gets into the functional. Uh, Social Security is very heavy in particularly with the psychiatric diagnosis, mm -hmm. with, with looking at uh, the person's ability to function. So the, the, the severity index is more important to... to, to, to it, it will probably get looked at a little bit, but, you know, the GAF, which I joked mm -hmm. about earlier, you know, I, I've seen people be evaluated by different professionals, three different professionals within a week, and you get a GAF from 30 to 70. So the, the, I think the, the severity, if, if you say somebody's severely impaired, obviously that's going to get a little bit more attention mm -hmm. than, than mild. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be factored in, but I, I, you know, I may be a little bit biased since I've been doing this so long, but I, I think the uh, people who evaluate uh, the claims do a pretty good job of balancing the diagnostic information, the functional information, mm -hmm. And sort of that it that all makes it, it makes mm -hmm. sense. Do you see any differences influencing disability for kids in the diagnosing of it? Because I all have some kids who who come in and say, you know, you know, mommy said it'd be bad, so I get my check. Or they'll say, I have this, so I get my check. I need this diagnosis for my check. Or they they look at. Or I have some kids that I've had teenager research what they need to have to get a disability check. Yeah, things like that. It's, the, it's there on the internet. I, I think the vast majority of people who apply for disability are doing it, it, it genuinely. Um, and there are, I mean, I've seen instances with evaluating kids where, uh, you know, they, they've told uh, the psychologist evaluating, I'm, I'm here to get my crazy check. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that's, that's a small percentage. And one of the things, uh, again, with, with kids, uh, as much as possible, and you probably, to those who work in the schools for teachers complain about having to fill out all the, the forms, they try to get as much collateral information as, as possible, not just a, you know, a one-shot uh, kind of thing. That's where special ed records are, are very, very useful um, in terms of uh, sort of putting, putting the whole puzzle together. Because I always document stuff when kids come and say stuff like that. I'm like, because they, they want that check. And because they've heard from, you know, if they get a diagnosis, they, I have something that immediately run out, we'll get papers wanting to apply for disability. If but I, I've seen reports where a kid has made that kind of comment, and then you look at the, the evidence and you go, well, yeah, he's, he, this, this kid's pretty impaired. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily rule out that they're uh, uh, sort of exaggerating. That. It's kind of which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Yeah. All right, Beth, any other questions for the audience? Looks so. like some of the audience is vacant. <laughs> These people yeah. here phones are too nice to leave, but the distance sides have gone. Thank you all for Thanks, everybody. Today. We appreciate your completed evaluations, and let's also thank our panelists.